So um, I just noticed that um, the first speaker is just joined in. And this is uh, uh, exact 902. So we do have very tight uh, schedule today. So um, perhaps uh, it's the right time it, uh, starting today's uh, uh, symposium. OK, so officially, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning. And uh, um, uh, I'm Peter Park, Associate Professor in Civil Engineering Department at La Sonde School of Engineering, New University. On behalf of uh, Smart Phrase Center, today I'm serving as the hosting chair for the 2020 Smart Phrase Symposium. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Amir Azip, your university's vice president of research innovation since May 2020. Azip was the founding chair of the department of EECS of your university from 2006 uh, to 2014 and vice chair of university uh, senate from 2010 to 2011. He has more than 15 years of experience serving in senior university leadership positions. He was a founding dean of the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science at Concordia University. I would like to welcome uh, Professor Azip for his opening remark today. Azip, it's yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Park. Merci beaucoup. Uh, good day, everyone. Bonjour and bienvenue. I am Amir Asif, Vice President of Research and Innovation at York University. It is my pleasure to be here with you virtually at the 2020 Smart Freight Symposium, a unique collaboration with the University of Toronto, McMaster University, the region of Peel, and many other industry partners. We are thrilled that the Lausanne School of Engineering is hosting this important annual event. As this meeting is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you're currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you're on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the, on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care by Anish Inuvik Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Bendit. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dish with one spoon, wampum belt, covenant and agreement to peace, peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So I'll, after the acknowledgement, I'd like to thank once again the Lasson School of Engineering staff and faculty members, in particular, Dr. Peter Park for organizing this event. We also greatly appreciate the work of the chair, uh, Matthew Rorda from University of Toronto, the vice chair, al Kafi Hassini, McMaster University, the, who is also the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee, York University Peter Park, as has previously mentioned, and the founding board member and industry liaison, Dr. Shabir Sayed. This symposium is a wonderful opportunity to showcase all the work that has transpired over the last year to key industry partners, collaborators, and government stakeholders. Indeed, the mission of Smart Freight is to improve the economic vibrancy of business environmental sustainability and quality of life for residents of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. This is accomplished by providing innovative evidence-based research, decision support, advocacy, training, and monitoring to coordinate transportation infrastructure, land development, regulation, technology tools, and resources that improve goods movement activities. Smart Freight's mission truly resonates with us at York and Lesson because we believe in the power of research, scholarship, creativity, education, and dialogue to transfer, transform ourselves and the world around us for the better. York University, in particular, the Lesson School of Engineering, bring expertise from across many disciplines to build new tools and strategies to tackle the complex societal challenges. Collaboration has always been a key part of this. York embraces collaboration, new ideas, and a strong sense of purpose. We collaborate with companies and institutions to create impact across sectors and borders. 
We pride ourselves on global and local partnerships and collaborations. Today is a perfect example of such a fruitful collaboration. This year's program spread over two days is outstanding. Professor Peter Park will tell you more about this and walk you through the agenda of November 20th and 27th. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor John Morse, Associate Dean at Lassant and York Research Chair in Space Exploration. John is an internationally recognized planetary scientist and space engineer whose research explores the atmospheres and surfaces of other worlds. His research group has been a member of the science and operation teams of the first ESA and NASA space missions to Mars and Titan, and has been awarded the NASA Group Achievement Award on 16 different occasions. John has published 63 papers, garnering more than 4,950 citations. In 2018, he was elected as a member of the College of New Scholars in the Royal Society of Canada. Over to you, Professor Moores. For the rest of you, have a wonderful day and enjoy the symposium. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank uh, Amir Asif, our Vice President of Research and Innovation, for those terrific opening remarks and uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, as many of you may know, Amir is an engineer himself, and he is a member here of the Lassonde faculty. So we're really, really thrilled to have his support for the Smart Freight Symposium. So I'd also like to welcome all of the guests here at the second annual Smart Freight Symposium uh, presented by the Smart Freight Center and hosted by the Lassonde School of Engineering at uh, York University. On behalf of the uh, Lassonde School of Engineering, I'd like to share a few slides showcasing our school. So if I could uh, have those up. Thank you, Sandy. All right. And uh, let's go on to the, uh, the second slide here. So here at Lassonde, uh, we incorporate the concept of Renaissance engineering into our learning experience for students through cooperative education and industry partnerships, entrepreneurship and leadership opportunities, and also global learning. Now, the school itself, we have the third slide, uh, was launched on November the 1st, 2011, and was backed by a $25 million donation from gold mining entrepreneur and philanthropist Pierre Lassonde. So on to the next. So since you're not able to actually join us here on campus today, unfortunately, I'd like to share a video that highlights life here at Lassonde and also showcases our newest building, the Bergeron Center for Engineering Excellence. So let's go ahead and start up that uh, that video. Oh, I guess the video is not working. Um, I will go on. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Well, no worries. Um, so, um, just just to give you a few um, statistics about the school, uh, we've got about four thousand six hundred and sixty undergraduate students, one hundred and thirty five faculty members and uh, 439 graduate students. So Lasan is actually a rather large community, um, even though we're fairly young, only having been in existence for about eight years now. And if we go on to the next slide. Uh, we also have uh, 11 different undergraduate programs that those 4,660 undergrads are made of, um, and five graduate programs for our 439 graduate students. Those are across four departments, civil engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, and earth and space science and engineering. So for the students in the room, please visit our website for the requirements and the deadlines to apply if you are interested in joining our family. Next slide, please. Our co-op program is available to 400 plus students every year and is a flexible in duration of work term and time of year. We have continuous recruitment and no rank and match. If you're interested in these opportunities as a student or a partner, please reach out to our team. And next slide, please. Meanwhile, on the research side, Lassonde has five strategic priorities. And these are environment and climate change, space exploration, infrastructure development, resilience and sustainability, intelligent and interactive systems, and bioengineering. So uh, keep this slide up. Uh, just a few more things before I, I get you into your day. I want to thank you all once more for attending today. I'm really excited to see the excellent opportunities brought forth by the Smart Freight Center. 
we're pleased that our own Dr. Peter Park is acting as the chair of the Smart Freight Center Scientific Advisory Committee. Moreover, we are delighted that other Lausanne faculty members are affiliates of the Smart Freight Center and woven into their excellent interdisciplinary framework created by the involvement of the University of Toronto, McMaster University, and York University. Congratulations are in order. The Smart Freight Center was recently awarded an NSERC Alliance grant to fund a new research initiative entitled CLUE, and that stands for City Logistics for the Urban Economy. This is led by Matthew Rorda, chair of the Smart Freight Center, along with co-applicants El Kathy Hassini, McMaster University, and Peter Park from right here at York. Together, they secured more than $3 million from NSERC, and they also received contributions from many partner organizations, some of whom are here with us today. And that totaled more than $11 million in grant funding. We're delighted to support this expansive effort, and we extend our congratulations to everyone who was involved. Now, before I pass the microphone back to uh, Professor Park, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for their contributions today, and I look forward to hearing about your work. To the attendees, thank you for your participation, and on behalf of the Lausanne School of Engineering, welcome. Over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much, John. So I'm going to share my screen. So can you see my uh, presenting slide? I just shared my present slide. Can you see it? Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, once again, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Park, currently serving as a chair of this uh, uh, scientific advisory committee for Smart Phrase Center, and then uh, hosting chair of this uh, 2020 Smart Phrase Symposium. I'm just going to briefly update the Smart Phrase Center for those attendees who may not be familiar with the Smart Phrase Center. The um, SFC was established as uh, um, one of a kind center of excellence in uh, growth movement in GTHA in early 2019, thanks to the tremendous uh, financial and other support from the regional peer uh, with the 2.4 seed funding over the uh, five year study window. Um, indeed, this uh, establishment was uh, supported by the regional peers previous Movement strategic plan published back in 2020, uh, 2012. Initially, the SFC was established as a multi institutional cent uh, research center amongst the University of Toronto, Manmesa University, and New University. We are aiming to conduct various interdisciplinary research projects, and that will require working together with many private and public sector including a few of early supporters for the Smart Ferry Center shown in this slide. I'm very happy to announce that we are very close to including Rice University as a new institutional partner of the uh, SFC. We will grow together. Uh, last year, the three institutions have focused on three specific types of the Smart Ferry Center project, and that they are e-commerce project led by McMaster, off-peak delivery project, University of Toronto, and intelligent lane utilization project uh, led by your university. And we have discussed this issue in the last year, 2019 Smart Ferry Center Symposium. Uh, this year, we have broadened the areas of our research project, and some of the outcomes will be presented during these two day uh, symposiums. Uh, for your information, I'd like to simply uh, show some sort of keywords that include, for example, mobile robot warehouse fulfillment systems. Uh, multimodal autonomous last mile delivery system, freight data warehouse project, and truck signal priority, truck platforming, and so on. Uh, before I'm wrapping up, uh, I just want to say that uh, when I presented my research last time uh, in, back in Toronto University, I mentioned that the definition of transportation is moving people or goods from one place to another. And then I also mentioned that uh, based on this definition, uh, we cannot say that uh, moving goods is less important than moving goods. But the, during pandemic, we just happened to realize that perhaps uh, more likely moving goods is much more important than sometimes moving people from one place to another. At this moment, all of us are currently staying at home still uh, participating in this uh, virtual important event. 
However, at the same time, if you go outside, it's still important that moving still goes to uh, places like uh, hospitals, pharmacy, gas stations, and groceries uh, every moment. So having said that, uh, certainly uh, supply chain workers and the logistic uh, employees, they are essential workers serving for our society. Uh, perhaps the one of the uh, evidence that uh, we can say the moving goods is so much important for our society during this pandemic is shown in this slide. Uh, we were still listening to the uh, development of vaccine a couple of days ago. And then what we are calling it as a cold logistics has become a very challenging for our society. How we can distribute this vaccination to wherever needed while we are maintaining such low temperatures. So certainly our job is not just a secondary job for our society, it's essential and presumably one of the most important job for our society. Um, before I wrap up my presentation today, I'd like to uh, thank you for every attendees, for the speakers and moderators. For the speakers, what we are going to do is that we are going to show uh, time left uh, for your uh, chat box. So while you are presenting, please look at your chat box. We are going to show uh, the time left uh, three minutes earlier. Uh, the last thing that I just want to say is that uh, please enjoy this uh, symposium. There are a lot of interesting uh, stops that will be presenting by many industry partners, uh, including um, regional peer and uh, uh, minister uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to now introduce the moderator for the first session, uh, Ms. Judy uh, uh, Barberan. Uh, she is acting as the executive director at the UTTRI. She holds an advanced degree in both engineering and planning and has had careers in logistics, technology, and finance. So welcome, Judy, uh, for uh, uh, moderating the, for the first session. Uh, you are muted. Caught me today. <laughs> Won't be the last time. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you, Peter. And uh, Casey, I'm going to invite you to share your screen while I introduce you. Go ahead. And I'll just let everybody know, uh, very unfortunately, Philip Fletcher from Chet was not able to make it today and he sends his regrets. However, we're really grateful that Michael Casey stepped into the breach. Thank you very much, Casey. He's the manager of the system policy officer at the Ministry of Transportation. And he's responsible for the ministry's freight policy portfolio. Uh, for most of the six, 20 years, He's been at the ministry. He's been working on various planning and policy roles at the Ministry of Transportation. And today he's going to talk to us about the GGH transportation plan. Whenever you're ready, um, go ahead. Thanks very much, Casey. We see your screen and we're not hearing you. Yeah. There Sorry. you are. I was just trying to find the mute button. Um, I feel like that's the, uh, that's the catchphrase of 2020. Um, uh, all right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for the, thank you for the ability to present on this. I know, uh, I'm just going to start my timer to make sure that I'm giving time to everybody else on the, uh, uh, I'm not stealing time from other people's presentations. Uh, I understand the, the focus of this session is on, uh, challenges to the freight system. So I'll talk to you a little bit about, uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe Transportation Plan that we're working on, uh, which, you know, covering two different sets of, of challenges to the freight system. One is uh, growth over the long term for a very fast growing region like the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Uh, and the other one that has been more and more of a focus of that plan over the last, uh, I'd say, six to eight months is uh, some of the things that Professor Park was talking about in his pr presentation. What are the impacts of the pandemic and how many of those would have impact on a long range plan and how do we address those? Uh, so I'll, I'll run you through that a little bit. I'd also just like to do a shout out. I actually have the lead uh, for the strategic goods movement network component of the Greater Golden Horseshoe Plan uh, on the call today. Um, uh, Paul Semple. So we'll, when we get to that section, if there are detailed questions on that, I might just ask Paul to jump in and, and speak to some of those as well. All right, so with that introduction, um, we'll just jump right into it. So 
Um, we've been working on the Greater Golden Horseshoe Transportation Plan in the Ministry of Transportation since, oh, I'd say probably 2017. So it's been, uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. Um, and the focus for that is you know, we are in a very, very high growth region. Uh, we uh, were one of the fastest growing regions prior to the pandemic. Uh, looks like we will probably still be one of the fastest growing regions coming out of the pandemic because, you know, thankfully Canada has had fewer impacts uh, than many of, the, many of the other major cities in North America. Um, uh, uh, so we will continue to be a fast growing region. Um, very built out region, largely the core of the GTA and the core of the GTHA is very built out. It's hard to find new infrastructure. It's hard to build our way out of. Um, and, you know, we're facing an era of significant change in terms of automation, in terms of, you know, some big shifts in terms of how, how people will need to use the transportation system and how goods and people can move on the transportation system. So all those pieces kind of came together to us as to, you know, uh, as sort of the problems we wanted to solve with this transportation plan. Um, and just to highlight, you know, sort of a couple of the big ones, uh, I've got a chart on here that just shows sort of baseline congestion between 2016 and 2041. These projections were done pre-pandemic. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're taking a look. I expect we would still be somewhere close to the 2041 number. Um, you know, even after the pandemic impacts, but basically we're looking at congestion both for passenger cars and for freight vehicles to more than double within this region. This is road congestion uh, based on the growth that we're expecting in the region by 2041. Uh, and that, you know, this picture just kind of shows an example of what that looks like for the freight system, which is the focus of this workshop, right? By 2041, uh, so basically what you're showing here is the width of the lines, typical engineering drawing, the width of the line uh, shows volumes, the color shows how bad the congestion is in terms of volume over capacity, uh, and the black dots are, you know, projected major, major receivers or shippers of goods within the region. Um, so what you can see here is, you know, uh, vehicles trying to access some of the major hubs in the region, uh, you know, along that 401 corridor, along the QEW corridor, are going to be experiencing significant congestion and sub substantial delays. And, uh, you know, just to illustrate that, basically, you know, some of the modeling we did showed that between uh, Pickering and uh, the edge of Mississauga, travel times in that region could grow from 60 to 90 minutes for goods during the AM peak. So pretty significant increases in delays in the region, which is a, a real challenge for logistics and goods movement. Um, and, you know, and we're projecting that that congestion uh, without, you know, without changes to the system will impact all major highways, including the 401, the 404, the DVP, the QEW. Uh, so a pretty broad region-wide impact. Um, and so, you know, the idea of the plan uh, this kind of just shows where we are with the plan, but the idea of the plan was to take a look at, uh, you know, what kind of infrastructure solutions can we put in place and what kind of policy solutions can we put in place to help address that problem. So we're looking at both infrastructure and policy as sort of a virtuous circle. Uh, you know, what policies can we put in place to help manage demand uh, and shape demand both over time and over uh, space in the region. And then you know, based on that, what kind of infrastructure do we need and where do we need that infrastructure to help address some of those really critical strategic uh, links in the network for where people and where new goods need to move. Uh, so we've done a lot of uh, sort of baseline work, uh, including quite a bit of resiliency analysis, which has come in useful to us over the last uh, six to eight months, where we did a very broad range. We forecasted out to 2051 with a very broad range of solutions or a very broad range of different growth projections to really understand, you know, which pieces of infrastructure were most critical and which types of transportation solutions seem to perform the best across that broad range. Um, uh, sorry, so we did that baseline work. Uh, we went out and we talked about goals and objectives for the plan, including some public consultation. And where we're at right now is really narrowing down the infrastructure and policy options. 
Uh, this gives you a sense of sort of, and, and we're quite a far way into that now. We started with a long list of over 700 options that we uh, have consulted with sort of a freight advisory committee and with a, um, uh, and, so, and with a municipal uh, technical advisory committee. Uh, we've narrowed that down to sort of a medium list and we're getting very close to what our, you know, short list of potential well-performing options are in the region. So, um, you know, our goal here is to uh, have a draft that's ready within the next uh, uh, two to three months to be able to provide the government on this plan. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how we've been addressing pandemic impacts as part of the plan. Um, as I said, we, we had done quite a bit of work. We've been thinking about things like automation, things like, oh, I only have four minutes left. I'll make this really quick. Um, uh, we've been thinking about things like automation, uh, things like near sourcing and manufacturing and changing supply chains uh, before uh, we started the pandemic as part of our resiliency analysis, but we've really increased some of the focus on that. Uh, you know, since the since the pandemic has happened, and, and our shortlist evaluation is going to include sensitivity testing uh, for some of those major disruptors. Um, so we'll be actually looking at our shortlisted networks on the infrastructure side and saying, okay, which of these perform better with a higher or lesser degree of e-commerce? Which ones perform better with a higher or lesser degree of connected and automated vehicles? Uh, we've also, we're also looking at things like smart ports and smart shipping uh, and near sourcing and manufacturing as disruptors that we're going to be uh, testing as part of our short list of options. Um, certainly COVID-19 has really highlighted the need for us to rethink that disruptor testing. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we've also started building in some additional sensitivity tests that are, that are more pandemic specific on the, both the passenger and the on, on the freight side. So we're looking at, you know, an increase in the extent of telecommuting and what does that mean for the system? Um, you know, uh, a reduction in transit use, uh, you know, if, if we're into a period of, uh, you know, if, if we're into a period, which I don't think is actually going to come to pass, but it's good to test for, uh, of fear of transit, um, because of, you know, fear of crowded spaces, uh, you know, what does that mean in terms of transit use? Um, uh, move to more sort of off-peak work travel to be able to accommodate less crowding on the system uh, and an increase in the extent of e-commerce, obviously. Uh, and these tests, as I said, are real sensitivity tests that are gonna help us support and choose what the best performing network at our shortlist stage is. Um, the other thing I just wanna really quickly talk about is part of the GGH plan, uh, as, P as Professor Park said in his presentation, right? The approach of this plan is we need to move goods, we need to move people. We're not making a preference of one over the other. And a real focus of this plan has been on, you know, how do we move goods and how do we maintain the growth of the region from a logistics perspective? Part of that has been developing a strategic goods movement network um, uh, with municipalities and with our freight advisory committee. Um, the goal of the Goods Movement Network is to really identify those key freight corridors, rail, road, and connections to the air and marine sector uh, that are really driving uh, th that are really driving the logistics system in the region. Identifying those, uh, you know, and putting a policy system in place for those to help ensure that they can they can form that function. Uh, so we have been working on that. We've been sort of validating sort of what our key logistics points are, what the key routes are with municipalities uh, and with our freight advisory committee. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're still in the process of fine tuning that in particular, looking at, you know, what are the future industrial employment areas? What are the future commodity flows and cross border truck volumes that we need to be looking for and need to be accommodating as part of this network. Um, and, you know, we are going to be setting up another meeting with our freight advisory committee in December to further fine tune uh, the strategic goods movement network with that committee. Um, so that's it. I'm about 35 seconds over, uh, but uh, uh, that's it. I'm happy to take questions once everybody else has done their presentation, and uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and indeed, well, I hope so. And what a great way to start because that is the background. The policies that are coming are the are the are what everybody else will be working with and building towards. So thank you very much, Michael. Um, next, I'd like to call up Michael Scrimna. Michael, go ahead and share your screen as I introduce you. OK, 
Okay, Michael Scrim is joining us from Stats Canada. In his 25 years there, he's delivered many key data products. Is, is there someone talking? Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for joining us. We're just moving on to our next speaker. We have uh, two more speakers and then we'll have a Q&A. Thanks very much. Uh, so Michael Scrim, uh, importantly for us, he's the Assistant Director of the Centre for Tourism and Transport Statistics, and he's leading the teams in the transportation domain to look at improving and filling gaps in data for freight movement. So today he's going to introduce to us the Canadian Centre for Transportation Data. Michael, thanks very much. Ten minutes, thanks. Thank you and good morning. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, to, to chat with you guys this morning. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, certainly to reach out and to build some partnerships uh, going forward in terms of data, in terms of the work that you guys are doing, which uh, is very interesting. So uh, I really have no slides. I just want to speak to you guys a little bit about uh, the way, way why, we, why we have a hub, what we're doing with the hub, um, and what we want to do, I guess, not just ourselves, but certainly Transport Canada plays a big role in this. So this uh, hub that you're seeing here, and we're not going to do a demo of it, certainly happy to happy to take offline comments and, and walk through more detailed with each of you uh, at a later date. But uh, the reason we, we, uh, we launched this hub, I guess, certainly uh, the premise was that there was an absolute need uh, recognized by Transport Canada, Stats Canada and the Government of Canada a few years ago to uh, have one, one place uh, for Canadian transportation uh, data. Uh, unlike our counterparts in other countries, uh, certainly uh, they, they have sort of built um, hubs or space where uh, people can go and get the latest and greatest data or studies uh, all in one place. So, so one, of the, one of the drivers here was really, uh, hey, let's do this in the Canadian context. Um, so we built this hub a couple of years ago. It was launched uh, successfully with our uh, counterparts at Transport Canada. And there was really three elements to this hub. Uh, element number one, I guess, was, was to uh, bring together in one place um, a start at the data holdings that we had at the federal level, as well as uh, certainly there's some indication and some uh, links to the data that's held by some of our partnerships, uh, whether it be uh, associations, whether it be other government departments, or it could be universities. So there's uh, links there, but so that was one part of it. In terms of the data component, uh, certainly we're looking to grow that component uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So input from you guys is really helpful. The second component to this hub, I guess, is the, uh, is the analytical component. So not only did we want to bring data to the forefront, uh, we also wanted to bring analytics, whether that be uh, uh, papers, whether that be infographics, whether that be uh, tools that would allow uh, users, uh, it could be it could be the average user or a very sophisticated user to start to understand uh, and use the data or understand the concepts or the ability of what this data represents. So certainly one of the elements is that can and, and, other, and other departments that we face is that uh, we do a lot of you know, really valuable work, but uh, we, there is a learning, there's an opportunity and we need to sort of uh, help users understand what we're trying to measure, what we're trying to do, the value of the data uh, the value of what it can bring in terms of solutions. So that's another large component. Uh, so again, we have some elements here on the hub. Uh, we're certainly working uh, again with colleagues uh, at various levels to sort of continually enhance that analytical component. Um, but certainly uh, as we've done with other hubs at Stack In, we've also sort of brought in other partners um, to sort of enhance where tools that you guys may have or other partners may have that are of value certainly are, are in, in scope for us as well. Uh, the third component uh, to this, this hub, I guess, is, is the collaboration piece. So uh, that, that, I guess, is uh, the outreach that we're doing with you guys today right now. We've done it as well with other federal and provincial partners on an ongoing basis or municipal partners. Um, so if there are opportunities for collaboration of existing data, uh, existing products, uh, we are certainly happy to collaborate um, the way forward, I guess, at the agency in terms of data on the transportation angle, whether it be e-commerce or business to business movement or uh, last mile, uh, I guess the approach is, is that we're taking is twofold. One is certainly uh, at the agency, we have, we have data needs. Uh, we're trying to fulfill the mandate and the needs of other departments, whether it be provincial or municipal or, or local. 
the same time, uh, we have a role in, or, in order to sort of get this data out the door and provide that data uh, to, to Canadians and to users so that they're aware of the data uh, and maybe we can improve. Um, so the one, the one element certainly is that we're, we're doing some innovative work. Uh, we're trying to look at developing more and more uh, timely, uh, detailed products at the agency that uh, relate not only to transportation, but elements around the transportation. Uh, it could be infrastructure, it could be jobs, um, it, could be, uh, it could be various pieces to that to puzzle, uh, investments in it. Uh, so, so certainly as we move forward, uh, one of the major goals at the agency, and, and certainly we're using the hub to promote this, is certainly uh, innovation through uh, innovative work, uh, through data, through data products, uh, through partnerships um, with, with many other departments. So I think that's sort of, uh, it's, it's quite short there, but I think I'll leave it at that. That was sort of the premise of, of why uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to have a, have a discussion with you guys today. Thank you. And, and thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, of course, if you're, when you're talking to, to people like us and you talk about uh, being a source of data, because we do a lot of we do a lot with data, and looking for partnerships, of course, that just you know sets off sets all kinds of bells going off for us, and we look very much forward to um, starting this conversation and learning more about what has been done there. I would like to invite. Um, uh, people to uh, put, we will have time for Q&A afterwards. So I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to put a question into the q and I'll do my best to get to it. Um, and now I'll ask Sebastian. Sebastian, if you'd like to share your screen while I introduce you, we'll keep this moving. Thank you. So Sebastian Prince is a director of government relations at the Retail Council of Canada. And he's a very successful provincial and provincial advocacy um, for for-profit retail entities. We've had the pleasure of working with Sebastian on the off-peak delivery file, um, where we've benefited, benefited mightily from his experience as a government relations professional. And today he's going to talk to us about the logistics challenge that his clients, major retailers, face during the pandemic. Sebastian, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here. And uh, maybe, you know, in the wake of that, I should also mention that uh, I think it was, it was uh, UFT's uh, strong work on the off-peak delivery file that kind of allowed for a lot of that advocacy success. So I'll kind of take that and, and put it back at your feet, uh, Judy, and at, at Matt Rorda's. And uh, of course, uh, Sab uh, Sabir has been, uh, from Peel, has been really helpful throughout this, this whole process too. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, so uh, what, I, what I'm going to kind of chat a bit about today are some of the logistic challenges throughout the pandemic uh, a little more broadly here. Um, so um, uh, so how do I, uh, so yeah, okay, there, perfect. Okay, so, so I'll start off just by describing who the, the Retail Council of Canada is. Uh, so we are an industry association. Uh, we represent uh, uh, various retail members, uh, two governments, uh, provincially and federally all across Canada. Uh, uh, our membership base uh, by, by retail trade, by StatsCan retail trade numbers, we represent about 60% of core retail sales uh, are part of our membership. So that's across all categories. Uh, hardware stores like Canadian Tire and Rona Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, uh, we've got uh, clothing retailers like H&M. Uh, uh, and of course, grocery is, is probably the, the biggest category that, that we represent. We actually have much higher representation in, the, in this, that subsector. We represent over 95% of retra retail trades uh, sales in the grocery category. So probably anywhere you buy your grocery, uh, 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 Loblaws, Sobeys, any of their subsidiary brands, we represent them to, to, to each of the different provincial governments. So that's kind of a bit about us. I'll kind of get started here on some of the logistical issues that we, we face throughout the pandemic. Um, uh, so, so likely uh, folks will, will remember uh, some of the, the, the stockouts that we saw uh, early on uh, uh, throughout the pandemic here. Um, uh, I'm just gonna switch to the next slide. So yeah, so, so uh, retailers basically run a pretty sophisticated supply chain. Uh, we have we have for a long time tried to to minimize our, our backroom uh, spaces and and we've we've prioritized kind of keeping goods in, in warehouses and distribution centers and stockpiling there and then there in order to kind of reduce the footprint uh, uh, at our store premises. Uh, that's that's been great in a lot of ways. Where we saw it fall down really quick was uh, during the pandemic when Canadians started to panic buy. Uh, so essentially, uh, just to kind of ground this problem here. Uh, consumers were going to the store a lot less, uh, so, so traffic was down, 
but every time they were making purchases, they were purchasing significantly increased volume so that the basket size, as, as we call it, was, was significantly higher. Uh, so that basically did kind of two things for us. So the overall aggregation of, of less people but higher sales did result kind of in our favor. It, there was an increase in sales. Uh, but what it also really meant was a massive unpredictability in the supply chain. When people are coming to your store less and buying significantly more, uh, uh, the kind of consumer preferences of that day will dictate what's out of stock or not. Uh, so, so we saw certain goods that would, would you know, be flying off the sh shelves, uh, selling up you know, 80% when compared to the same day last year. And then the next day that, that same item would be down 50%. Uh, so even though we had enough of the supply in our distribution centers, uh, we weren't able to kind of continue stocking it uh, on the store shelves. So this is kind of one issue. I'm going to move to the next slide here to kind of talk to, oh, oh yes, first, yes, the, the, the issue in a, a single problem that we all recognize here, the um, uh, out of stock toilet paper shelves. So this is probably the, the exact codification of this problem for us. Uh, I'll move to the next slide quickly here just to, uh, to talk a bit about uh, the other issue. Um, uh, at the same time as, we, as everyone saw those, those out, of, out of stock uh, store shelves, um, we also had a, a massive increase of food waste. So on Twitter every day, we were getting calls perpetually throughout the start of the pandemic from OMAFRA, from the minister's office, saying that, uh, that farmers were dumping milk. And this, this is a, 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 an example of a truck. That, that white liquid is, is literally milk. They are just dumping milk. Um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, and we'd heard from some of our supply chain partners that there was massive overstock in inventory and spoilage was occurring. Uh, and kind of, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this question. I didn't want to scoop myself in the slide, but I'll tell you the answer here. Um, because, because all the restaurateurs were shut down, there was kind of this interesting dichotomy where we couldn't keep food on our, our grocery store shelves. We couldn't, we couldn't stock them quick enough, so to speak. But at the same time, there was other parts of the supply chain where, you know, 50 pound bags full of, of potatoes that of course no consumer wants to buy. Uh, that that the, if you look in the back room of, of, of food, fast food restaurants where, you, where, where, where a lot of fries get processed, you'll see these huge bags of potatoes. Uh, those were spoiling because consumers don't, don't buy 50 pounds of potatoes at a time. Um, and, and, you know, and milk, milk relies on, on restaurateurs uh, just as much as they rest, rely on, on grocery stores. So while we were posting purchase limits, you saw dumping. So this was kind of, you know, an interesting dichotomy at the start of the pandemic where you had um, grocers with increased volumes overall, but, but still food waste occurring. Uh, so I'll move to the next slide here to, uh, to talk a bit about some of the solutions. So there's kind of two sets of solutions and, and, you know, I, I'm saying solutions, but, but, uh, of course there's, there's always more that can be done here. So th these were two things that, that happened on our end. Judy kind of mentioned at the start here, um, off peak delivery. So this had been a file that had been in discussion. Uh, uh, we were originally uh, planning with, with, with U of T and with, uh, with Peel and some several other partners to have a slow rollout implementation where there was kind of best practice bylaws that were developed in September and there was a, a, a slow municipal scale up. Um, we, were, we were planning to something, something to that effect in, in, in late February, early March, right when the pandemic hit for, for, for that coming September. So this was kind of a, a policy that we'd, we'd had a lot of um, conversations with government already about that they were extremely well aware of. Uh, uh, Peel and Toronto were, were great leaders. They, within days of, of, of our stock out starting to occur, they, um, they quickly enacted off-peak delivery for, for, for their section of the marketplace. Uh, and then we managed to, to, to get the province to, to react uh, a day or two after that to issue it province-wide. Uh, so, so I'll mention the smart freight research here. So, uh, the smart rate research, smart freight centers research from from the Peel pilot indicated that uh, an 18.1 percent increase in the movement of goods. Now, I'll say that this this was an interesting time, right? Because obviously there were no traffic on roads. So, um, uh, the effect that we kind of saw here was more that we were able to run uh, trucks longer uh, and get to more stores. Uh, so that was kind of the more immediate anecdotal effect that we saw of off-peak delivery during the pandemic crisis mode. Uh, uh, I suspect that in kind of a, a longer term scale out when we see uh, purchase levels now that they've kind of normalized and now that traffic levels are kind of creeping back up, so to speak, that, that, that there's a very different use case for off-peak delivery. 
in, in the moment of the pandemic, it was to get goods from our distribution centers as quickly as possible to storefronts and to, 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 to utilize that expanded uh, time frame. So this was kind of one solution to some of those, those two logistical challenges that we, we, uh, we helped codify and work on with the Ontario government. I'll move to the next slide here uh, uh, to, to basically talk about the other solution. The other solution is kind of a, uh, a working together solution. So RCC set up an internal working group with, with uh, top executives at our grocery chains. So we, we basically had kind of meetings uh, three times a week to try and quickly issues vet. Um, uh, so that was, you know, everything from uh, public health unit restrictions that were overly onerous that we needed to try and, you know, maybe tweak or scale back or kind of right size for, for, for business to, to help them implement. Uh, but it was also supply chain things. So, you know, off peak, um, uh, I've, I've got here another little example on the slide about some pharmaceutical ingredients that uh, were, were kind of getting backlogged uh, because, you know, uh, India had, had escalated some, some export re restrictions during the pandemic. And we kind of move to increase the implementation date of a policy that was already tracking on the books for private label pharmaceuticals to kind of bolster total supply. Uh, so that was kind of one element that we, we were working on. The other bit was Ontario set up a series of, of uh, inter-industry working groups. So we had conversations regularly with agri-food manufacturers, supply chain folks to discuss how we could get those 50 pound <laughs> potato bags and turn them into something that were more retail appropriate and consumable by, by, by the regular customers. So that there was kind of less spoilage, you know, um, we, we, we could kind of better make use of that food and not see it go to waste. So these were kind of some of the solutions we worked on. I'll go to my last slide here, uh, just to kind of talk about research questions, next steps. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously the big one is, is you know, did, did the, the response to the pandemic work? Was, did, was that an efficient way to, to kind of manage some of the supply chains? I, I, I think that the, the two solutions that we saw were helpful, but you know, um, uh, of course, there's, there's probably always more things we could have done in, in retrospect. Um, uh, the actual impact of off-peak delivery, I think, I suspect that there was a very different impact and effect of off-peak delivery during the pandemic than, than what we would see in a, in a regular scenario. So I think that that was kind of an, an interesting thing um, that, you know, pandemic response to off-peak delivery is, is different than the, the typical logic, uh, logistics change efficiencies that we see. Um, uh, some other questions are, are in and around food waste. Uh, to, to, to me, that was kind of um, a, 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 a bit of a, in hindsight, I uh, wish we had done that better sort of moment because it, it you know, it, a lot of food did spoil um, uh, of, of no fault of, 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 of anyone, so to speak, in the chain, just because of the, the massive, very quick reduction in, in restaurants and the lack of good transitions from those restaurant large scale products over to, to something that was easily consumable. Uh, and then maybe just to wrap up here, I'll, I'll mention we're, we're heading into, it, you know, it sounds like there's going to be some, some further lockdowns announced in the not too distant future. Um, uh, so, so, you know, this will be an interesting kind of mini second data point moment. Uh, of course, there's a lot of caveats to that data point because this will be regional as opposed to province wide and, and a lot of uh, um, uh, problems that kind of come with that. But, uh, but you know, uh, a question to kind of pose there is, is, is it'll be interesting to see kind of what, what happens this time around and, and how things uh, work and transition uh, in, in kind of the, the coming experience, so to speak, for, uh, for, for retailers and for restaurateurs. So I'll end off with that. Thank you, Sebastian. Yes, for putting it right into the moment. Um, and I'm going to invite um, um, all of our speakers, please, to put yourself on video. And uh, we have time for a few questions. Thanks very much. Peter will, Peter will give me a nod. Just come in and cut us off when we hit time. Um, so uh, Michael Scrim talked about uh, the initiative at Stats Canada to um, have a hub for national transportation data and uh, mentioned that he wanted to bring together federal data with that of other partners. So I'm wondering, um, Michael, what data would you hope to see from some, an entity like the Retail Council of Canada and um, its members um, and from the provincial government um, which of course is another, I know that they've been working on data. And, uh, and uh, Casey and Sebastian, um, what would you see getting out of a federal data source and what would you contribute?
Who'd like right. to go? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I guess. So, uh, so I guess what we're what we're seeking, I guess, is uh, uh, would like in terms of is, is two ways, right? So, uh, in order for us to develop um, new outputs, I guess, or new products, uh, I think there's there's a real uh, interest of ours, and certainly the discussions have already happened with our our counterparts here in the session, as well as certainly others that are going to speak later. Um, so, I think. Our, our role, I guess, is to really uh, provide a broader audience uh, in order to disseminate that data so that it's it's widely used, it's widely uh, understood, and that uh, we can play the link to, uh, to allowing that data to flourish, uh, certainly from a Canadian perspective. So we have an interest in the actual products. We also have an interest in, uh, in the development of, uh, as I said, we're doing a bunch of innovation, we're doing a bunch of uh, development. Uh, so for one example is on the trucking side in terms of uh, looking at uh, the issues of first mile, last mile. So we're working with our counterparts at Transport Canada. Uh, but certainly in order for us to have success, I'll call it that, or have a product, um, we wouldn't. We really don't want to start at, at, uh, at, at ground zero though. I think um, data sets, uh, information, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, all the lessons you guys have and the, and the, uh, the value that you guys have certainly would help, right? So just a concrete example on that is, is there's data, but there's also concepts. So when we're talking about uh, any of these concepts in terms of trucking, uh, there's certainly lots of people in this audience that can help us out uh, to build a framework to sort of define those concepts that would be used across industry using a Canadian context so that when we do produce a product, uh, it makes sense um, and can be widely used. So that's a very, maybe that's a very simple example, but that's sort of what we're trying to achieve. Thanks. Sebastian or or uh, Casey, what, Sebastian, what data would your clients uh, be looking for and what would they supply? Yeah, yeah, so so I think, um, so I, I know of some of the data that we have, uh, it's always, it's always of course a conversation uh, with, with businesses to see what kind of their, they're willing to share, um, but uh, I know I know in the past, and this is again partially through through work that Matt's done, uh, that there is kind of a, there are there are, are databases that that um, record. Uh, so I guess there's GIS related info, and there's uh, there's uh, some some codification of that in terms of of of, of start times and, and some things like that. So I mean, uh, there's certainly there's certainly info we can dig up and we can kind of uh, potentially get. Um, I think I think for us. Um, I think some interesting questions uh, are, are, you know, uh, around some of that pandemic response uh, in particular. I think this is kind of a, a very interesting moment in time, and it's something that we're going to want to reflect on uh, in, in much more detail for the future. Uh, that that this this was kind of a, a, a big moment when a lot of uh, retailers really kind of banded together to kind of solve the problem collectively, which isn't the market norm. Uh, normally, competition. Uh, kind of prevents um, uh, some some of those those dialogues to kind of make sure you know food supply chains that you know we're getting those right. Uh, so, so you know I think that those are are um, interesting questions uh, that 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 you know that we can potentially help facilitate some bridges to our members to try and kind of get get at some of those data and 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 codify in some way. Great, Casey. So, I'm sure you're talking with your counterparts. What would you be looking for out of this? What would you be able to give them? So first of all, I would like to say, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to StatsCan for their data hub. Uh, in my new role, which is you know focus, focused more on freight policy, where we've been looking more at pandemic impacts, we've, we have been digging into that as, as one of the key data sources that we're using. So it's really good to have that hub available, um, first of all. So I wanna say thank you to that. I'm also going to say a shameless plug, um, because as a ministry, we have been working to make much of the information that we have available through things like our commercial vehicle survey, through things like the GPS data uh, that we acquire uh, available publicly on our I corridor system. So much of that information is out there, and you know I would welcome anybody to sort of take a look at that. It's it's publicly available. Um, and I'm going to skate the question a little bit and talk about where I think I would love to see data go and where some of the stuff that's happened during the pandemic uh, in terms of supply chain trends and some of the stuff that Sebastian has talked about in terms of people coming together um, 
to solve some of these supply chain issues where I think it could be really helpful. So, you know, one of the trends that I'm seeing or that I think we're seeing from the pandemic is uh, a bit of an acceleration of uh, shippers and receivers recognizing they need to have greater visibility from an information perspective across their supply chain. So they know what is where and they don't get, stuff doesn't get lost and spoiled. Um, and, you know, in an area like Peel Region in Toronto, where we have a whole bunch of different logistics hubs, we have an airport that's moving more cargo than uh, ever before right now. We have a couple of major intermodal facilities. We have the largest cluster of distribution centers in Canada. Um, if there's a way for us to start to aggregate that information in a, you know, where we can protect individual companies' informa information, but we know what commodities are moving when and whether the supply chain, whether the pipe is thicker next week than it is this week, we can be a little bit more intelligent about how we're using a transportation system. We might be able to share, we might be able to look at things like off-peak deliveries um, in a little bit more of a, you know, clear way. Um, you know, in a, a little bit more of a strategic way and, you know, understand why we need to make, you know, it, I, I don't know, I think it allows us to be a little bit more nimble. That would be paired with better sort of smart infrastructure built in the region, but it could allow us to be a lot more nimble in terms of how we move people and goods around in the region. That's ideally what I'd like to see really long term is, you know, some greater partnerships where we can get a better sense of, you know, what's the commodity, when's it coming, and how you know what modes it moving on, um, and if government has a little bit more visibility into that, then I do think that there are some creative things that we can do around lane management, around road management, and so forth, uh, that can be really helpful. I I, I think that's a really interesting uh, insight to have. I mean, the, here the here the province in in Ontario is trying to prepare for the growth that Michael talked about and. And we all will all remember the map he showed us of the demand for goods movement uh, projected out to 2041. Um, and how how can you prepare for that without some knowledge, not not anything that's competitive about the business, but knowledge of what the demand will actually be and how it moves on the road. And and so I think uh, that's a great way to leave it. A thought I had as as we went through this, we we learned a lot through the pandemic about. Um, the needs of what we called essential workers to get around. And if we have a, a, a demand that it exceeds this, uh, the capacity we have, um, as we emerge from all of this and, and get thriving and growing again, you know, will there be a notion of essential goods movement? And, and uh, I don't think we know. I mean, we're going, we're going, to, we're going to come back. We're going to come, um, people are going to get out there. Everybody's going to get going again. The region will grow and we'll be relying on, uh, I would also say thank you Stats Canada because as Canadians, we uh, in so many different ways benefit from the you know, decades of data that Stats Canada provides to researchers and, and, and policy planners. And uh, to the province of Ontario, um, I corridor, I encourage people to look at it. It's been a great piece of work. And to partners like the Retail Council of Canada who bring together us together with you know, the, those who need to use our, the facilities and the data that are being created to go forward. And with that, I'd, I'd like to all thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank the speakers um, for their participation. And I'd like Peter to take us on to the next phase of this. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Judy, uh, for your moderating the first session. So now we are going to have a 10 minute break. So I have prepared the homemade Copy for all of you. So enjoy the copy and take a break. And then uh, beginning of the second session, which will start uh, 10 10, uh, we have prepared two keynote speeches uh, from Minister Sarikaria and uh, Mr. Neno uh, Lenika from the chair of uh, regional appeal. So uh, please have a 10 minute break and then we will uh, see you soon uh, for the second session. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit late uh, due to my health break. Sorry about this. So I'm going to uh, quickly invite the uh, second session moderator, uh, Todd Rett. He is the chief executive officer for the uh, Brampton Board of Trade. I welcome Todd to uh, moderate in the second session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. 
And it's uh, my honor to uh, introduce our next speaker, the chair of the region of uh, Peel, Nando Yanika. Nando was appointed uh, regional chair and CEO of the region of Peel uh, by regional council in 2018. Prior to his position as regional chair, uh, Nando served as city and regional councillor for the city of Mississauga and the region of Peel for 30 years. During his career, the chair has served on numerous boards such as the Police Commission Board, Enersource Hydro Board, and the Credit Valley Conservation Board. Most recently, he served as the chair of the Peel Police Services Board in 2019 and remains a member of that board. Chair Nyanika has also volunteered with the Trillium Hospital Foundation, Red Cross, Symphony Board, Salvation Army, Red Shield Appeal, the Mississauga Food Bank, and uh, is a uh, Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee recipient for his quarter of a century years of, uh, of volunteer service. We're very fortunate to have the chair with us today. Welcome, uh, Chair Yanika. Todd, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be able to speak here at the Smart Freight Symposium today. And let me send a special host, uh, shout out to our host, the Lalonde School of Engineering. Um, it's also a joy to be here with Brampton Councillor Gurpreet Singh Dillon is here. I saw him on the dais as well. And I'd be remiss as well if I didn't acknowledge the great work that Sabir Saeed does for me here at the Region of Peel as the Director of Good Movements. And of course, our other friends on our Good Movements Tax Force, uh, Dr. Park himself, of course, Dr. Hasimi, and Dr. Rorder, who I know is also tuned in. Uh, one of the first orders of business that I want to deal with right away is I really want to begin by thanking the people who do the goods movement for us, the trucking professionals who have been out there working relentlessly to ensure that essential goods, including food, supplies, and medicine, are safely delivered to our communities during these very, very challenging times. So a big shout out to those folks. As you know, the regional municipality of Peel is the second largest municipality in the Greater Toronto area, consisting of Brampton, Caledon, and Mississauga. Though you may not be aware that after Toronto and Montreal, I represent the third largest jurisdiction municipally in Canada. So uh, we're quite an amalgam between the three of us at about 1.5 million people. Goods movement is crucial to the region of Peel for many, many reasons. Peel is a significant freight hub for Canada with an estimated total of almost $2 billion worth of goods, commodities that travel to, from, or through the region every day. Seven 400 series highways serve our region and carry the highest truck volumes in all of North America. Our region is home to Toronto International Pearson Airport, Canada's largest and busiest airport for both passenger and cargo traffic. Our region is also home to the CN Brampton Yard, which is our nation's largest intermodal terminal. There are more than 2,000 trucking companies in Peel, made up of some of the large corporations and some small businesses as well, each of which contributes to the economic well-being of the region and the larger DTA. Four out of every nine jobs in Peel are tied to goods movement related industries, which create around $30 billion in annual income. Overall, goods moving related industries contribute 50 billion annually to Peel Region GDP, which is 48% or almost half of all our gross domestic product. In recognition of the importance of the goods movement in future challenges, the Region of Peel partnered with three prestigious institutions in Ontario the University of Toronto, McMaster University, and York University, and established the Smart Freight Centre in late 2018. The Region of Peel has committed a total of $1.2 million of seed funding over the next five years to this Smart Freight initiative, initi uh, initiative and projects that are important to the region and ensure that the centre is fully established. The Region sees this collaborative network as an important initiative to improve the efficiency of goods movement and the quality of life of the residents within Peel and the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. The talented staff and students at these institutions collaborate with both the public and private sectors to find new innovative and leading edge solutions to complex transportation problems. Projects undertaken by the Smart Freight Initiative are meant to improve good movement network efficiency and connectivity, environmental sustainability, safety, and also assist with youth employment and education. As an example, one of the many successful projects completed by the Smart Freight Center includes the Peak 
for the region of Peel's off-peak delivery pilot, a project which provides an innovative solution to improve network efficiency while reducing emissions. Various important and exciting research projects are currently being undertaken by the Smart Freight Center, and you will learn more about them today and in next week's symposium as well. Some of this research projects have been tailored to provide insight and recommendations related to the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the goods movement industry, including the following projects, mobility interventions to protect supply chain workers during pandemics in Peel, traffic estimation for e-commerce last mile deliveries in Peel region, and COVID-19 data science application on traffic monitoring in Peel as well. I'm also delighted that the Smart Freight Center has received the NSERC Alliance Grant, which is a major funding award from the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. This funding will go towards a new research initiative titled City Logistics for the Urban Economy, or CLUE. CLUE partners supporting the initiative include public sector partners such as the Region of Peel, York Region, City of Toronto, and Transport Canada. Private sector partners include Bosch Corporation, Chet, Esri Canada, Geotab, Gatic, Shipper B, and others. Non-governmental organizations, the Atmospheric Fund and the Pembina Institute, and the University of Toronto, McMaster University, and York University. In addition to our significant involvement with Smart Freight Center, the Region of Peel also leads the Peel Goods Movement Task Force. The Peel Goods Movement Task Force was established in 2009 to bring together public and private sector interests involved in good movement in order to address existing challenges and future opportunities for growth movement. The mandate of the task force is to develop a common vision for goods movement in the Peel area, to bring together key stakeholders to guide future improvements to the good movement system, and to plan for the implementation of short, medium, and long-term improvements to the goods movement framework. Members of the Peel Movement's task force include elected officials, Transport Canada, the Ontario Ministry of Transportation, our local municipalities, adjoining municipalities, the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, and a host of private sector partners. The last meeting of the Good Movements Task Force took place virtually July of this year, and the objective was to get together and have a better understanding of movement-related initiatives and processes during this COVID-19 from all stakeholders. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, it is crucial that public and private sectors work together to ensure the delivery of goods during these challenging times. I want to mention another major initiative that is being led by the Region of Peel, which is the potential establishment of a United Nations Regional Center of Expertise in Peel Region. As I already mentioned, Peel Region's location at the heart of the Toronto and Hamilton area has resulted in the community to heavily be centered itself around transportation, given its decades of experience as a leader in goods movement that can be shared with the global community. The establishment of a Peel Regional Center of Expertise focused on the theme of sustainable transportation and goods movement, a focus that will allow Peel and its partners to collaborate with the global community for the mutual growth and development of all communities. The Peel Regional Center for Expertise partners include Region of Peel, University of Toronto, McMaster University, York University, Ryerson University, Supply Chain Canada, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, the Pembina Institute, Loblaws, and many, many other private sector partners. We submitted the final application for Peel Regional Center of Expertise in September and are anxiously looking forward to a positive response from the United Nations. I want to conclude my remarks by uh, re-emphasizing the importance of this collaboration. Um, as was mentioned by that kind introduction, I've been in the municipal world for 32 years now, but 30 years as a counselor for the downtown of Mississauga. During that time, I approved, if you can imagine, 30,000 units of development. During that time, we also had a great deal of discussion, as we do now, about the movement of people public transportation. Are we building LRTs? And we are in Mississauga. Are we building subways? My point is once those people move in, very little discussion has been had about how we're going to get products to them. So these 60,000 people that move into these 30 households, we talk a great deal about, will they get on public transit because they can't all drive, no question. But at the end of the day, they need a tube of toothpaste. They need to buy a shirt. They need to bring their groceries home. The groceries have to come into town. And dare I say in my 30 years, a great deal is being said, especially lately about moving people 
but I don't know that we've gotten more than a dollar with regards to moving the products. Hence why this initiative is so important to me. It makes us use our existing infrastructure more carefully, more scientifically, more thoroughly, because that's the low hanging fruit. So with that, I want to thank everybody with regards to this whole initiative. Goods movement issues and challenges can best be addressed when we all work together. And this is a, a living proof of that partnership. It's my hope that we all continue to collaborate to ensure that our goods movement industry is sustainable, safe, efficient, and innovative. And speaking of safe, it's with that that I have to beg off now because one of my other duties is I'm also chair of our board of health. And I think it's going to be a rather tumultuous day. And, and we've got to speak with some of our shareholders, stakeholders, in advance of the one o'clock announcement from the premier. So with that, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Professor Park. Todd, thank you for your kind introduction and look forward to tuning in next week when we have our next session. So thank you very, very much for this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Yanika, and uh, Godspeed with your next uh, uh, meetings on health. And thank you for making time for us uh, here thank today. Uh, our next uh, speaker will uh, be the uh, Minister of Small Business and Red Tape uh, Reduction. I think we're very fortunate here in Peel Region to have a Minister of the Crown at the Cabinet table, someone that uh, empathizes and understands uh, the goods movement, supply chain, and day-to-day -day market realities uh, and issues facing not only the companies, but the tens of thousands of uh, those that are employed and owe their livelihood to uh, goods movement, transportation, logistics sector here in uh, the region. Of course, I'm speaking of uh, Pravneet Sakaria. He has the honor of representing his community as the member of provincial parliament for Brampton uh, South uh, and serves as the Associate Minister of Small uh, Business and Red Tape Reduction. Uh, before answering the Call the Public Service. Uh, Prob meets worked as a corporate and commercial associate at Miller Thompson. Uh, he has an undergrad University of Windsor in, uh, I'm sorry, in law and undergrad from Wilfrid Laurier in finance. And uh, he's an active volunteer. If you've ever visited his uh, office, you know uh, that he's an avid sports fan and uh, no, no doubt we'll never forget who won the 2019 NBA championship Go Raptors. Uh, he entered public service in order to be a strong advocate uh, for hardworking families in Brampton South and all across the province. He loves uh, and uh, is committed to giving voice to the concerns of everyday people. He is humbled to serve and he joins us here on video. It's great to be able to address all of you today. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us at this uh, important event. Uh, you know, reaching out virtually when we can't connect in person is really important right now. And it means a lot to me to be able to use all the tools at our disposal to participate. And, and thank you to the organizers of this symposium for bringing us all together virtually together to discuss the path path forward as we face the second wave of COVID-19. You know, there really is no sugarcoating in. These are tough times. Everyone has been asked to sacrifice something. And we really need to look at safe and effective ways forward. You know, as a son, a husband, a new father, uh, you know, my heart breaks for the lives the pandemic has taken and the families it has devastated. And as a member of this government, I'm, I'm in a, I recognize that I'm in a privileged position and I can help protect the people in my community and across the province. You know, everyone here knows that has been especially tough for our small businesses, the backbone of our province's economy. You know, it is my job as Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production to find ways to support small and Main Street businesses that we all depend on. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through the Main Street Recovery Act. The new act modernizes regulations to keep pace with business needs while creating flexibility for them to innovate. One of the main things we have heard in our consultation with businesses is that allowing off-peak deliveries has moved from being an, on a wish list to a stark necessity. And we have heard you. And as part of the act, if passed, we would permanently allow for 24-7 truck deliveries of goods to retailers, restaurants, and distribution centers. This would build on temporary changes we made to help keep shelf stock through the first wave of COVID-19 earlier this year. This meaningful change would keep supply chains moving, supporting businesses across sectors. It would reassure business operations can be maintained during this difficult time. And it would give consumers greater confidence that their local retailer or restaurant, for instance, would have what they need when they need it. We didn't make this change without doing proper legwork. And I wanna thank you in particular for getting that ball rolling. Several of you may remember 
that meeting roughly a year ago when you, along with the Region of Peel, met with my staff to pitch this idea. We knew we would end up here today, but it's rare that groups come to my office with ideas that are tested and thought through and would have such a profound effect on our province. As many of you know, when as well those bylaws have been in place for decades and often capture off-peak deliveries, restricting them from making deliveries between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. This has resulted in a patchwork of noise bylaws throughout the province. Trucks have since become quieter and harmful emissions have been reduced. And as part of my efforts during COVID-19, I've been looking at ways to alleviate costs on businesses to support productivity, growth, and supply chain efficiency. Ontario has had three periods for off-peak deliveries that have been conducted in Ontario, whether it was the 2014-2015 Pan Am Games, the 2019 Peel Region, and the 2020 COVID-19 pilots, which all suggest that fuel costs and emissions reduced by approximately 11%, and up to 30% of trucks move off the road during rush hour periods, and harmful air pollutants are reduced anywhere from 11 to 18%. Many businesses, have seen a significant increase in online delivery since the start of this pandemic. This has placed pressure on the supply chain to deliver goods in a timely manner. And I was very pleased to see such support for this measure from environmental groups, municipalities, and regions, as well as the industry. I know that this group knows the value of pilot projects and played a major role in setting up the first off-peak delivery trial in Peel. It is that kind of teamwork that will get us to the other side of these tough times. And of course, allowing 24 seven delivery is only one part of our small business recovery plan. In the coming months, we'll continue to explore new ways to support small business recovery. And one thing that won't change is our commitment to your long-term success. Our vision is to ensure that Ontario's small businesses have what they need to recover, rebuild and reclaim their right to succeed. We know we can't do it alone. And please know that we are here to listen to your suggestions and work together to find the blessed solutions for everyone. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, and uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Maddie Ewing. Uh, Maddie, uh, please feel free to load your uh, deck if you uh, have one uh, now uh, as I introduce you. Maddie is uh, with the Pambina Institute. Uh, she's an analyst uh, there, of course, Pambina Institute is Canada's leading clean energy uh, think tank. And uh, her topic today is urban freight electrification in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. Maddie, please go ahead. You are muted. Uh, Maybe please unmute. Oh, thanks so much. Is that better? That's super great. Go ahead. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Maddie and I'm here today representing the Pembina Institute, where I work as a transportation analyst. For those who don't know, Pembina is a nonprofit think tank with offices across Canada. And we advocate for strong, effective policies to support Canada's clean energy transition. Our work is primarily generated through research and analysis and stakeholder consultation. And our work on freight in particular is geared at supporting the industry and governments in achieving decarbonization of freight while building more resilient communities. At the Pembina Institute, we see freight as being one of the next frontiers for climate action. Transportation represents a quarter of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions and freight represents an increasing share of this. In fact, at its current rate, it's expected that greenhouse gas, gas emissions from freight will surpass those of passenger vehicles by 2030, as illustrated by the graph on my slide here. As urbanization, economic activity, online shopping, and the demand for same-day home delivery increases, the number of delivery trucks and vans on the streets of our cities is growing. And as we've seen, the COVID-19 pandemic is prompting more Canadians to buy online, which will only escalate traffic in urban areas. Now is the time to consider what the prolifer proliferation of delivery trucks is doing to the air that Canadians breathe and the impact those vehicles are expected to have on global warming. So addressing the emissions impact of freight activity in our cities will require a multi-pronged approach. While not the only approach, we see the electrification of urban or last mile deliveries as a key part of the solution. As I'm sure most of you know, in areas where the carbon intensity of grid electricity is low, so where there's, for instance, a large portion of renewables, 
electric vehicles can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve local air quality. But urban delivery vehicles are also particularly well suited for electrification. These vehicles travel short distances, on average less than 100 kilometers in a given shift, and typically return to a central depot at the end of the night. They can easily take advantage of overnight charging when electricity rates are low. The carbon intensity of grid electricity also tends to be fairly low overnight as well. And research from the California Air Resources Board and CalSTART has shown that the urban delivery segment is in fact expected to be the second wave of electrification. Lessons learned from early deployments of battery electric transit buses can help advance the electrification of this urban delivery vehicle segment. So what have we seen so far? We've already seen several major North American companies signal their interest in electric urban delivery vehicles. Amazon, UPS, and FedEx have all already placed substantial orders for electric cargo vans. Meanwhile, Purolator is already testing low-speed electric vehicles on delivery routes in Toronto and Montreal. And interna international companies like DHL and IKEA have committed to full electrification of their delivery fleets within the next five to 10 years. We're also seeing a shift on the manufacturing side. So vehicle manufacturers have signaled their interest and commitment to electrifying the last mile. Ford has officially launched an all-electric version of their ever-popular transit van. Mercedes has released their e-sprinter in Europe. And several other manufacturers, including Canada's own Lion Electric, have announced plans to or are already manufacturing electric vehicles suitable for urban deliveries. Despite interest from urban delivery companies and commercial vehicle manufacturers, barriers to urban delivery electrification remain. So first off, there are still limited and inconsistent zero emission vehicle policies and supporting infrastructure to help businesses integrate and scale commercial electric vehicles. Second, vehicle costs and some charges on utility bills may be prohibitively high. Third, we also see limited available public charging infrastructure. And while depot charging is often preferred by businesses, the installation of these private chargers can be time intensive and fairly expensive. Lastly, businesses are lacking reliable resources and information to help them navigate, adapt, and overcome the changes that are required with a switch to electric vehicles. So what are we doing at Pembina to help overcome some of these barriers? We recently launched a project funded by the Atmospheric Fund in which we aim to build the business case for urban delivery fleet electrification in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, develop an action plan for urban delivery EV deployment, and establish a zero emission vehicle supportive policy guide. So step one of our project is to build the business case for urban delivery fleet electrification. And we're working with researchers at Canada's National Research Council to model urban delivery vehicle operations in the GTHA and quantify the expected reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and fuel costs and identify any charging infrastructure requirements. So our modeling work has centered around the development of five to 10 routes that have been developed using data obtained from Geotab, which documents the actual operations of door-to-door -door delivery vehicles in the GTHA. We'll be creating routes that represent a range in vehicle operations. So anything ranging from a light delivery day to operations during the busy holiday season. For each route, we'll be modeling the operations of a single vehicle model, and in this case, we've select, selected an electric cargo van based on feedback we heard from businesses. And our model also takes into account logistical considerations, so how much downtime each vehicle has between shifts. Things like this can help us inform charging patterns, for instance. And again, this was developed through feedback that we received from businesses. Through the model, we will be able to identify estimated electricity costs for charging, greenhouse gas emission savings, vehicle battery size requirements, as well as any operational changes required and infrastructure requirements for charging. These outputs will ultimately inform the development of our business case and action plan for EV deployment in the GTHA. So step two of our project will involve the development of an action plan for urban delivery fleet electrification. Mm -hmm. We hope to equip businesses with resources and information that can help them integrate and scale up electric fleets here in the Toronto area. We want to clearly articulate the steps that businesses need to take in the near to midterm to effectively deploy electric vehicles. This will include actions pertaining to things like vehicle procurement, infrastructure build out, utility engagement, just to name a few. And we've already been engaging some of the major utilities in the GTHA, including both power generators and local distribution companies, as well as fleets that have experience with EV deployment to uh, identify common obstacles and potential solutions to address these. So the final step of our project will be to establish a ZEV supportive policy guide. This, in this, we aim to identify and advocate for policies to reduce barriers to electrification. 
These policies will span a range of different mechanisms from strategy development and regulation to incentives. And some early solutions that we've identified include establishing a ZEV strategy for commercial vehicles. So right now, most ZEV strategies are geared towards passenger vehicles. Expanding green vehicle license plate programs to commercial vehicles, which grants green vehicles access to high, things like high occupancy vehicle lanes. Establishing low emission zones in cities that on, only vehicles below a certain emissions intensity threshold can access. And curbside management tactics, such as preferential loading zones for lower zero emission vehicles, investments in charging refueling infrastructure, or skills training for maintenance workers and operators. So the findings from all of these different aspects of our project will be summarized in two final reports, one for businesses and one for policymakers. We'll also be hosting a webinar in the spring of 2021 to discuss with key stakeholders how we can accelerate urban freight electrification here in the GTHA. And finally, we'll be looking to engage key policymakers in the region to discuss the implementation of the ZEV supportive policies that we've identified. And with that, thanks so much for your time today and feel free to follow up with any questions during the Q&A period. Maddie, thank you uh, so much uh, for this informative uh, presentation. Uh, I do notice that uh, uh, we have some questions uh, that we'll take after our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Naz Capano, but thank you for that informative uh, overview of uh, your alternatively uh, fueled uh, fleet. Um, okay, uh, Naz Capano is Manager of Transportation Policy and Innovation in Transportation Services. Naz, if you could load your uh, uh, slides so that uh, we are ready. There we are. That's good. He has over 30 years experience uh, uh, in transportation uh, and infrastructure asset uh, management. Uh, he's worked on exciting projects like uh, examination of tolling on the Gardner and the DVP, uh, car share policy, uh, etc. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, the City of Toronto's freight and goods movement strategy. Welcome, Ness. Uh, thank you, Todd, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we'll just jump to the, the next slide, please. Um, today, Adrian Lightstone of WSP, who is our prime consultant on our freight and goods movement study, and I will be providing a high-level overview of Toronto's freight and goods movement strategy. Uh, today's pr presentation will cover a number of aspects, uh, project vision, goals, and the process undertaken through the study, highlight some of the key findings touch upon some of the modeling efforts uh, undertaken during the study, and finally briefly talk about the strategies identified for implementation. Next, please. Prior to developing Toronto's freight and goods movement strategy, we wanted to ensure that there were clear expectations of what the strategy would need to achieve. That meant that we needed a clear project vision that would guide the development of the final strategy. The vision for our strategy needed to articulate clear objectives and ensure that it would be in alignment with other city policies, uh, programs such as Toronto Vision Zero Plan, Congestion Management Plan, Curbside Management Strategy, just to name a few. Uh, goods movement would have to have consideration for safety, sustainability, economic prosperity, and ensure quality of life for Toronto's citizens. I won't read the vision, it's, it's on the screen for you all, and I'll let you absorb that. Next, please. In support of the vision, seven goals were identified and they would guide the development of the strategy. The goals are the qualitative and quantitative impacts the strategy would aim to achieve through a portfolio of effective strategies that would ultimately be recommended to our council. They include system performance, uh, through, which through that we want to provide an efficient, reliable, multimodal transportation system that enhances freight mobility. Through access performance, we want to preserve and strengthen access to employment areas, last kilometer deliveries, and connections with local and provincial freight systems. Through the environmental goal, we want to be able to reduce the impacts of freight and uh, on, on greenhouse gas emissions. Through our equity goal, we want to ensure that the strategy supports livability in communities, especially in Toronto's most vulnerable residents, by reducing disproportionate impacts from goods movement through investments in freight infrastructure, as well as supportive policies and regulations. Through our economic competitiveness goal, we want to be able to reduce and eliminate the barriers in the freight transportation system to enhance the economic competitiveness and the growth for goods movement sector. 
and the businesses. Through our safety goal, we want to make sure that freight is operating efficiently through the city, but also in a safe manner. Through our adaptability goal, we want to be able to ad identify and anticipate and also adapt the, due to emerging trends, innovations, and the risks affecting the freight and goods, goods movement industry. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Adrian, who will cover the next set of slides. Thank you so much, Naz. Um, so as the project uh, structure and the process of which we undertook this study for the City of Toronto, there were three primary components. Uh, stakeholder engagement, which included uh, several multi-sector stakeholder workshops, uh, surrounding municipality workshops, and uh, very importantly, industry interviews. We interviewed uh, roughly 30 industry partners as part of this uh, work and did that to get a cross-section of the different industrial makeup of the City of Toronto. So we really wanted to hear a lot from them of what their issues were. The technical studies included uh, freight profiles for uh, all modes, air, rail, road, and marine within the city, a review of uh, supply chain by industry type and commodity type, best practice review of what other uh, agencies and jurisdictions are doing around North America and the world, uh, including a lit review of uh, major trends and risks that uh, we're seeing. And then there was a modeling component where we were looking at combining several different uh, data sets in the city of Toronto um, model uh, to be able to assess how goods were moving through the city and where there were issues related to congestion, reliability, safety, and others. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail. Uh, this allowed us to understand what the priority issues were, develop a menu of strategies, and be able to assess these. And that allowed us to develop a series of recommendations, policy recommendations, that we could compare against the themes, the goals, and the vision of the study, uh, which led to an implementation action plan uh, that we were able to produce. We've also developed a draft strategic truck network, which I will present uh, in a moment, uh, that is requiring some more consultation to finalize. Uh, next slide, please. There were, th there were six major key themes that emerged as we were doing the, the stakeholder consultation. And these were uh, safety related to the interaction between trucks and other users of the road network. A lot of this related to active transportation and, uh, and truck traffic. Congestion, and this was less um, industries who were concerned about congestion issues on the road, uh, but more predominantly about congestion being a major productivity loss as it relates to the movement of goods. Last mile delivery, uh, getting goods to where they need to go. And this is especially uh, important now with an increase in proliferation of e-commerce and other uh, types of um, ability to do those last miles, which are, which are changing. So we wanted to look at what some of the key trends and, and risks were in changing last mile delivery. Technology in the environment, um, similar to the, the prior presentation, looking at, uh, at trends in, in how technology was going to be able to allow for achievement of environmental goals. Um, operations, so supporting the, the movement of goods from a business perspective and allowing them to be able to enhance their productivity. And finally, uh, off-peak delivery, looking at uh, making the window for urban delivery more flexible where possible and shifting it off-peak to the evening hours. Next slide. Uh, we were looking to be able to understand how we could assess the recommendations and the themes that emerged uh, through some analytical tools. And really, we were looking at a few guiding questions. What are the issues related to safety? What are the issues related to congestion and reliability? Uh, where are the primary travel corridors for freight by commodity type? And this was important because different commodities have different needs with regards to uh, the, 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 the network. Are there temporal patterns or seasonal patterns that are important to us, uh, issues related to curbside management and parking, and finally, uh, tonnage versus value as a proxy for uh, state of good repair and economic competitiveness res um, respectively. And so that resulted in a few different models that we were able to develop. And these were based on a combination of uh, GPS data, the regional travel demand models, and uh, MTO commercial vehicle survey information and a few other pieces of information. Um, so that was a, a collision model, truck reliability model, emission model, tonnage model, and value model. And if you go to the next slide, this is just a quick example of some of the output of reliability as um, one of the maps that we had produced. And 
as many of you know, there are, are issues with, related to freight data and uh, availability of freight data of various different types. And so what we were trying to do is really show kind of hotspot areas where there would be issues of unreliability, travel time issues, safety issues, and so on. Uh, not at discrete points, but in general hotspot locations. Next slide. We were able to um, kind of use a lot of the information we had modeled to be able to put together a draft strategic truck network. And so this focused on uh, large truck volumes by OD pairs and two kind of primary truck network routes. The primary routes are essentially the highway intensive routes uh, to the, the freight intensive locations. And the secondary connectors are based on volume. Uh, and we tried to have some parameters that allowed us to establish where these would go. Now, this is a draft. This is not in the final uh, strategy. And the city is looking to do some additional consultation on this uh, as we go forward. Next slide and back to Naz. Thank you. As part of the final outcome of our freight and goods movement study, we developed 24 strategies that cover four different categories, which are highlighted in the, the blue boxes on the screen. What uh, you see on the slide are only five of the 24 strategies. Uh, the complete list is included in a staff report that was approved by Toronto City Council on October 27th of this year. For those that are interested in the staff report and want to read more about the 24 strategy, you can go to the web link that's provided on this slide or go to our council uh, website uh, for a look at our freight and goods movement strategy. Now, these strategies have also been organized in short, medium, long term uh, implementation timelines and basically one to two years, two to three years and three years plus. Uh, with each of these, there, there are designated stakeholders and partner divisions that have been identified uh, to our council. Uh, there will need to be further collaboration with many others on these strategies in order to get them implemented. Uh, this kind of has provided kind of a high level overview of our freight and goods movement strategy and sort of completes our, our presentation. So uh, Adrian and I would uh, be willing to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Naz. And my apologies for not introducing you, Adrian. Uh, excellent, uh, 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 excellent insights as well. Adrian Lighthouse is the national manager of WSP, WSP's advisory service uh, practice. Uh, okay, I do see that we've got a few uh, questions. Uh, I ask each of our presenters uh, to uh, respond uh, uh, if a question is directed to you. Matty Ewing, a uh, question came about uh, forecasting. When do you see, what is the ETA of uh, full electric electrification of freight uh, in uh, in the GTA. Thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, to be honest, and I know everyone's going to hate this answer, but it's still really difficult to say. Um, you know, we have seen manufacturers commit to um, electric vehicles. And while several models have come online in the past few years, OEMs are really just starting to get into the game. And so, you know, it'll be a while before we actually see a substantial supply of these vehicles. Um, there's also a lot that still needs to be put in place in terms of policy and infrastructure to support this. You know, there's a lack of electric vehicle charging infrastructure for commercial EVs with higher power demands. Um, and we need to kind of determine as well what's going to happen to the electricity grid in, here in Ontario with widespread electrification of these commercial vehicles that have higher energy demands. You know, are there grid, upgrade, grid upgrades that are needed and do we really have the capacity to support this? Um, it is, I think, a crucial step we need to take as demand for uh, goods movement increases in the last mile, especially. Um, so I encourage our uh, policymakers on the line here to start thinking in advance about what we can do to help support this. Thank you, uh, Maddie, uh, uh, and thank you, uh, Pardeep, for that uh, question. Tanvir asked a question. Uh, I think we've uh, all seen the response as well in the chat uh, with respect to uh, if we go to electrification, does that uh, have issues with respect to capacity, uh, load capacity, and therefore more trips? And uh, I know Adrian responded to the, that no, uh, uh, they're well below uh, capacity. We have another question uh, for uh, Adrian uh, and for Naz. Uh, uh, this one comes from Pardeep again. Um, with six key themes, uh, which theme the City of Toronto give the most uh, attention to, uh, weighing in terms of priority? And uh, uh, also, um, Kay Kobis has uh, an interesting question about conflicts to Naz and Adrian. Uh, do you see truck route links 
planned and proposed and that of planned and proposed transit projects in conflict. Pinch LRT, Steel's LRT. Go ahead, uh, Aaron uh, or uh, Nas. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll jump in first and, and Adrian could sort of add, add to this as well. Um, we did consider uh, transit routes as part of our development of our freight and goods movement network. Uh, we want to kind of minimize where we can, especially where we're starting to expand with uh, LRTs throughout the, the city as well. So we did have consideration for that. We want to kind of avoid that conflict if, if at all possible. And, and if the, those routes need to stay on those key transit routes, uh, we want to be able to that to know where the investment might be in the future as, as well. But Adrian, I'll let you add to that as well. Yeah, I think you, you got mo most of it when we, when we were doing, as we were working with the city on development of that draft strategic truck route network, we looked at uh, current truck restrictions. We looked at neighborhood improvement areas. We looked at uh, other parameters like bike network and transit network. And that established um, kind of w which of the routes we considered to be secondary or primary uh, truck routes. So uh, transit was was considered in there as part of that kind of conflict, as were a whole bunch of other elements. Good. Anything else on that uh, question, or we can move to uh, the next one. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, Maddie, I don't know if uh, Pembina has uh, done any uh, recent research on how much freight goods uh, have, are attributed or have been impacted uh, to online orders. I know that we've uh, seen a spike in online uh, orders. Uh, um, any data on that yet? This is a great question and I think something that uh, I've heard increasingly in the past few months since uh, the COVID pandemic hit. Um, it is really difficult to estimate, um, unfortunately. It, it requires the consolidation of data from a number of private businesses as well as you, that doesn't even include the gig economy workers. So getting data on parcel delivery from individuals who might have their own van and are uh, delivering just for some extra income. Uh, it is something that we are interested in looking into and are doing a bit of scoping research right now to determine, you know, are there other ways that we can figure this out? Are there proxies we can use? Are there indicators that we can look to, to help us estimate, you know, what parcel deliveries look like in Canadian municipalities? So nothing to report on at the moment, but stay tuned. Who knows? We might have something in the next little while, but can't wow. say definitively. <laughs> Lots of uh, new disruptions, uh, certainly uh, yeah, to uh, for us to think about and to study and uh, to act on uh, in, uh, in transportation, uh, online sales, as well as future of work assumptions as well. This question from uh, Majeri. Uh, Naz, Adrian, uh, was employee movement to industrial areas considered uh, in the strategy? Now, as you're on mute, and uh, Adrian, maybe you want to begin. I, I think the the question really is uh, about uh, ability for employees to access uh, em employment uh, areas, um, and so we we didn't consider um, transportation access by transit to distribution centers or by you know uh, private auto to distribution centers as part of the uh, study here. It was more about access of goods from um, distribution center warehouse uh, and so on to you know final destination and uh, various different retail locations. So that was uh, pr primarily what we were looking at. Very good. Naz, anything to add or I can move to the next question? Just, just uh, I guess briefly, what I would say also uh, as part of analyzing and where we would want our, our network to actually be, we did consider our neighborhood improvement areas, areas where they're low income areas. They are disproportionately affected by freight traveling through those areas. So we wanted to still allow freight to travel through those areas, but at least minimize it uh, to a certain degree to reduce some of those impacts to the communities. Fantastic, thank you, Ness. And uh, we're just a little bit over time, so we're gonna go to our last question now. And this is a good one. This one's to Adrian. Uh, this comes from Kevin uh, uh, By What kinds of data indicators are used to assess the metric you called unreliability of truck movement. I think that's a, a, a good, a very good question. Adrian? Thank you, and I'm glad I get the last question here. Um, so we used a variety of different uh, data sets to look at those different modeling um, 
uh, metrics that we had that we had modeled. Uh, for unreliability, we used uh, various different GPS data sources to be able to understand the variance around the mean travel time. So really, reliability is the variance around the mean travel time. And so we were using uh, GPS data and also the the region's uh, travel demand model, matching those two things up to be able to come up with that metric. Well, thank you, uh, Naz, and uh, thank you to each of our speakers, uh, Maddie, uh, Aaron, Adrian, uh, and our uh, elected leaders uh, as well. We are now going to go into a uh, five-minute uh, break and ask that you return for session number three, which will begin promptly at 11.10. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you in five minutes. Um, once again, uh, hello everyone. So we are going to uh, start the session three. So I'm going to introduce the, the moderator for the session three. Uh, the Dr. Mur Bodo is going to uh, run the session three and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Toronto. She also holds a Dean's Spark Professorship in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bodo, and uh, uh, moderate this uh, uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you all for participating in this great symposium. So welcome to the last session of the day. So hope you've been enjoying this great program that our organizers put together. And we will conclude the day basically with some research updates from the Smart Fright Center. And we have some great talks aligned for you as well for the last session. So let me finally introduce you our first speaker. Hassan Bayanuni. So let me quickly introduce his background to you guys. So Hassan has 13 years of experience in the ICT industry and he received his bachelor's degree in computer engineering from Ajman University in 2003. And then later on in 2017, he received his PhD from University of Salford in the United Kingdom. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at University of Toronto. He led the ICD IT SOS project as a part of this ICD or ORF project. And he's been working with the Smart Fright Center on mostly fright data warehouse and data analytics solutions. He also has some industrial experience. So he worked as an IT uh, on IT infrastructure engineering and solution architecture uh, and for a while. He led mega projects in ICT infrastructure. He also led some mega projects in smart cities and he's currently focusing on big data, data analytics, IoT solutions and smart city solutions. So we are happy to have him here today. So Hassan, please take it away. And everyone, please feel free to post your questions about any of the talks on the chat screen. And following all the talks, we will have a quick Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Mariva. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to present today the Smart Fit Center Data Warehouse Update. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this big team. And uh, today we do have uh, a short uh, journey just to introduce the data warehouse uh, uh, for the Smart Fit Data Center. Uh, my name is Hassan Bayanouni, and uh, today I would like to give you an idea about the data free, uh, the, the free data warehouse that has been built uh, within UFT, and it is part of the Smart Fit Center. Uh, we are focusing on the data warehouse on four, four main areas, uh, which is um, to enable the researcher to enable the analytics and modeling, uh, modeling solution for all the research that it is under the Smart Fit Center where actually we are collecting uh, and consolidating and managing different data sets that has been contributed or collected and will be stored or actually stored in the secure environment within UFT. And we will come on the coming slides where has, how, how those data has, has been uh, already uh, uh, secured, uh, hosted within UFT. Also, we are focusing uh, on uh, uh, ensure that this data uh, the, the, the data co confidentiality actually is maintained and securely uh, stored and received from the data providers and also distributed in the proper manner. Also in the uh, freight data warehouse, actually, we are addressing uh, different longstanding needs in the market and in the, uh, uh, on this industry to make sure that the greater Toronto area and Hamilton, actually, they have to improve their data uh, goods movement. Uh, for that, um, we are focusing on four main objectives under the Freight Data Warehouse. Uh, the first one is how we can host the data in a very secure manner. And second, how we can facilitate the data access for the researchers. 
where those researchers or entity will be approved entity under the data sharing agreement. And the last area, actually, we are focusing on how we can provide a basic visualization and analytics services to enable the, the researchers and researchers that going under that area, actually. For that, those are the three main objects that we are focusing on, and we are taking the lead within UFT to, to make sure that all of those have been fulfilled and provided for our researchers and research institutes. Um, let me give you an idea here about the data that has been hosted so far under the Freight Data Warehouse. Actually, we received a contributed data from Transport Canada. We received three different data sets. The first one from here, in, uh, uh, Incorporation, which is mainly the travel speed, uh, bear time, for different road segments. Uh, actually, the data that we received so far, it is covering the Ontario province. Uh, the second data set, and uh, actually, it is the GPS data which is mainly the ATRI data. Uh, and this is for commercial vehicles mainly. And the third data sets actually, it is again, it's a GPS uh, for commercial vehicles, which is from Shar Omni Tracks. Uh, those three data sets have been received since 2000. The data has been received actually from 2017 uh, up to date, uh, except the Shah Omni Tracks actually, it is historical data, which is from 2014 till 2017. Uh, also, we, we do have different data sources. We are not limited for those three data sets, actually. We do have different sources of data. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one, actually, which is the commercial travel survey, uh, which is uh, a research has been conducted by Metrolinx and UFT. And also, there is another data set. We will announce it uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the journey for the coming four years, actually. Um, if we are talking about, uh, since we are hosting this sensitive data, I will say, uh, and this data, it is some of this data, we will discuss it uh, later on in this slide, uh, that it has different data classification. We need to make sure that there is a governance model, there is a data policy in place to make sure that this data will be uh, uh, hosted in secure place and maintained and it is will be will, will handled actually by the team who's hosting this data. For that, we came out with a data policy which is mainly the documents um, collect and make sure that all the requirements from the different universities under Smart Freight Center, uh, funding organization and private sector who co contribute this data, uh, air all their uh, rules, regulations, data security has been maintained and took, uh, taken in consideration from data ac acquisition and how, how this data will be distributed or analyzed, uh, how this data will be shared, uh, who will have access to what, which is the user access and user authorization for this data. The most important part uh, actually, which is the cyber security, how we can secure this data and how we can maintain it and how we can acknowledge who has the data and who received it and what they did actually with this data and make sure that all the data users, they are under NDA and they are aware of how, how to use the data and how to handle it. Uh, for that, we, uh, we already formed a data governance team who is under the Smart Trade Center Governance Committee, actually. This the team actually is focusing mainly on make sure that the data has been secured in a proper place. They have a proper audit on the data uh, uh, process that since receiving the data till we store it, till we share it. Make sure the data policy, which is implemented in the right manner. And um, we, we make sure the end user or for the researchers who receive the data actually he's able to, to, to fulfill his requirement, what he's aiming to do within the framework of data security itself. And this data, the data governance model, actually we have the data, uh, it makes sure that the data owners uh, rules, regulations and policy has been uh, applied 100% to make sure that there is no data leakage or that there's no mis misconducting for the data uh, that we already sharing with the end user. Uh, for that, uh, what we did actually within the freight data warehouse, uh, we did data classification uh, for, for the data that has been received. Uh, our work will be received later on. Uh, we classified the data actually in three main categories. The first category, we do have a public data where this data can be broadly distributed. We, we can share it with um, uh, any researchers. We can share it with different organizations, but with the smart freight centers and the stakeholders. Uh, this is, uh, it's close to be an open data. There is no restriction uh, for, for, for this data to be shared or to be processed. Uh, the second uh, classification uh, for the data that we do have, which is the internal data, where actually it is uh, data, it is only available for the Smart Freight Center researchers. And uh, this data actually is required to be aggregated or uh, anonymized in, in, in a specific manner 
before we share it with the, with the smart fit center researchers actually. And why we are doing that, we are again, we are comply with the data contributors and data owners uh, for, 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 for the data sharing that we, we, are, we are processing under the smart fit center. Uh, the third area, actually, we, we, the, or the classification area, it is restricted data. Uh, this is restricted data uh, classification where actually it is mainly the raw data that it is hosted under the Smart Fit Center, uh, where um, it is strictly, uh, uh, it has a, the, the highest restriction where it will be accessed only by the data steward and uh, the data custodian under the Smart Fit Center. And uh, it is not allowed for even the researchers under Smart Fit Center to have access to that data. Uh, and it will be, they, the researchers, they will have access to that data through their queries they developed uh, during, uh, the, the, uh, we, during the coming slide. I will explain this process uh, in, in, in specific, actually, how we can uh, facilitate this data to the, to, the, to, the, to the researchers under Smart Fit Center. But actually, this is the highest confidential area or, or the highest confidential data that has been stored. Um, and it is, it is already stored under the Smart uh, Freight Center data warehouse, which is already uh, hosted within UST. Um, for that, uh, to house the, this is three different data classifications, we should have three different areas to, to, to make sure that this data has been handled or will be handled, sorry, uh, in, in very secure and, and appropriate manner, actually. Uh, for that, we created a three different levels. I will start from bottom up. Uh, the first one, actually, we created a web portal where um, users from freight, freight data, uh, from smart freight centers or from a public, they can have, uh, they can access to that portal. They can see the public data. They can see the moderated information about, they, they can see the uh, information about the moderated data that we are hosting, actually. Uh, actually, they can do a request for the data, but doesn't mean that they have access to the data. They can see only the public data and they can do a queries for that data. And they can do, uh, uh, they can see more information about the, the hosted or the, the restricted data, not the restricted data, sorry, the moderated data, which is the, the I will say, uh, uh, the, the second level of data that we, we do have. They can do a request uh, for the moderated data and they can receive it after, after a process that we, I will explain it in a minute. Uh, the second, day, the second uh, handling uh, data area that we do have, which is actually the staging area. Uh, actually, the staging area, it is, um, uh, and it is a place where we are hosting the uh, anonymized data uh, for researchers, where they can access the, the, the data structure, uh, or they can have an idea about the data structure that we do have, which allowing them to develop their queries, they allow them to, to have a hands-on practice on the data, but doesn't mean the results, it's accurate results because this is anonymized and uh, moderated data actually. So um, this is, we give them hands-on practice. They can develop their codes. They can publish it. They can hand it over to the freight data warehouse uh, data custodians and uh, they, can, they can process it later on. Uh, the last area actually, which is the hosting area, which is actually we are hosting the restricted data. Uh, the hosting area mainly it is under the UFT private cloud. It is highly secure area. Uh, there is only two to three users they have access to that area, mainly the data steward, the data custodian, who they do have access uh, to that area in a specific, actually. Uh, Hassan, sorry, we are over time. Can we jump to the conclusion, if you don't mind? Sure. My, my last area, actually, this is the structure for the, uh, the data freight data, where, the, the, the freight data warehouse. Actually, we do have the, uh, how we classify it and how we are managing the, 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 what you call it, the data handling within UST or within the spread, smart fit data center, actually. And uh, this is actually the portal. This is my last slide, actually. I'm jumping very quickly. This is the last slide where, where actually the, the portal where the users they can have access to, which is under the smart fit center uh, website. You can visit it and you can, you can have a look for, for the portal, actually. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give you an update about the Freight Data Warehouse. Thank you very much, Hassan. We will take the questions at the end. So let's move on to our second talk by Laura Mine. Uh, Laura is a postdoctoral fellow in Earth Sciences and Civil and Mineral Engineering at the University of Toronto. She works on impacts of traffic on greenhouse gas emission, urban air quality. And more recently, actually, she was looking at how electrical vehicles and cleaner trucks can help us to reduce population. Uh, pollution, sorry, tackle climate changes, whatnot. So we will probably hear more about those exciting moments from her. Please take it away, Laura. 
All right, thank you, Mary, for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the air quality and health benefits of greening freight movements. Um, so briefly, as you're probably all aware of, ambient air pollution is a serious threat for human health. Uh, the health risks associated with air pollution include acute effects such as stroke, hypertension, and long-term effects such as cancer, diabetes, or uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, in Canada, there are 1,400, 600 premature death theories that are attributed to exposure to ambient air pollution, which corresponds to $114 billion of health expenses. And in the GTHA, it's estimated, it was estimated in 2014 that 700 uh, premature deaths every year could be attributed to ambient air pollution. So as a consequence, it's essential to minimize population exposure to air pollution to tackle this threat to human health. Um, in Canada, the on-road transportation sector represents 22% and 18% of the emissions of nitrogen oxides, NOx, and black carbon, BC. Both NOx and black carbon are considered as markers of traffic-related air pollution. And in cities, the proportion of the NOx and black carbon emissions from the on-road transportation is even greater than 20%, which means that it's essential to design transportation systems that limit the emissions of such air pollutants. Um, the study area uh, where we've been looking at um, the air quality benefits of greening uh, freight movements is the GTHA, which houses about 7 million inhabitants and is divided into six regional municipalities. Um, we've developed a traffic emission inventory for cars and SUVs, trucks, and public transit buses for the region. Um, so trucks in yellow are responsible for more than half of the traffic-related nitrogen oxide emissions in the GTHA, and cars and SUVs are also responsible for large amount of NOx emissions. The trucks are the largest emitters of traffic-related black carbon, and they represent more than 70% of these emissions. Uh, but it's cars and SUVs that are responsible for the largest portion of greenhouse gas emissions, and trucks only represent 20% of those. So we've been particularly interested in studying how we can shape our transportation policies targeting commercial vehicles to improve air quality and reduce population exposure to air pollution. We've mainly worked on two study cases. So first, we were interested in quantifying the burden of commercial vehicles on air quality and on population exposure and health. And after this, we wanted to analyze how getting cleaner commercial vehicles on the roads could help improve urban air quality and population exposure and health. So these two study cases begin by analyzing emissions from the main sources of traffic-related air pollution. But it's not sufficient because there's the relationship between decreases in emissions and improvements in air quality is not linear, uh, in particular uh, due to uh, reactions that occur between air pollutants uh, in the air. So to the response to these two questions, we've developed a comprehensive framework. Um, and this framework is set up around a chemical transfer model, which is a complex model that simulates not only the dispersion of air pollutants, but also their chemical reactions. It's very comprehensive and it requires information on all types of air pollutant emissions, whether they are natural or anthropogenic, to be able to model the complex chemical reactions occurring in the air. And information on land use and metrology to model how pollutants disperse and react between each other. Um, the output from a chemical transport model are air pollutant concentrations at a fine spatial resolution, in our case, at a resolution of one by one kilometer over the GTHA. The emission inventory is important for this type of model and having the most refined inventory possible is essential. So in this framework, we needed to take into account all possible sources of air pollutant emissions um, that is anthropogenic sources such as power plants, traffic, industries, and other sources such as agriculture and shipping, and also natural sources such as the vegetation. Uh, since traffic is a larger source of emissions in cities, it is important to have a traffic emission inventory as detailed as possible. So we use the results of a traffic assignment model based on travel survey data, which provided information on traffic volume and speed along the different roads of the city. And we combine this information with emission factors uh, provided by an emission modeling software developed by US EPA called MOVES. And we got an emission inventory for private household vehicles, transit buses, and commercial vehicles. Then to evaluate the impact of changes of air pollutant concentrations on human health, we assess the health outcomes associated with changes in air quality in terms of numbers of years of life loss and number of premature death. And finally, we supplemented this assessment of health outcomes with a basic economic valuation of the social benefits associated with these numbers of premature death. 
Um, so for this, we used a value of statistical life, ESL, which represents how much people are willing to pay to reduce the risk of death. Uh, it doesn't include healthcare costs, so the economic valuation presented here is expected to underestimate the actual social benefits associated with improvements in air quality. So here, to study the impact of having cleaner vehicle fits on population exposure and health, we consider the base case with uh, private cars and SUVs, transit buses, and commercial vehicles. And then we designed a study case where we remove the emissions from uh, commercial vehicles to quantify their di direct impact on the air quality of the region. And then we designed a scenario where we assume that the trucks that have all trucks that are older than eight years have all been uh, renewed by uh, newer, newer vehicles uh, with uh, lower emissions. So here this map shows the years of life lost per 100,000 inhabitants attributed to commercial vehicles. So here the, the red color shows the location with the highest number of years of life lost per capita. And we say that the population losing the most years of life due to commercial vehicles is located mainly along the highways and around the airports. The region of Peel, which is known to have substantial tra traffic, is clearly affected by trucks, uh, especially around the airport, which draws in a lot of commercial vehicles. In total, it's 407 premature death every year in the region of in the GTHA that can be attributed to air pollutant emissions from commercial vehicles. And then we also calculated the social cost induced by air pollutant uh, commercial vehicles. And we've estimated that uh, the emissions from one truck uh, induce about $182,000 uh, of social cost during its life. So here on this graph, we show the annual social benefits that would be achieved with the replacement of uh, the oldest trucks uh, with cleaner technologies, uh, the population from the regions where truck traffic is concentrated would benefit from an improvement of air quality. And the total number of premature deaths prevented under this scenario amount 275, which corresponds to $2.1 billion per year in social benefits. Now, looking at a map of the social benefits per 100,000 inhabitants, we see that the region of Toronto is benefiting the most from an improvement in truck technology. And we also see that the region of Peel would greatly benefit from improvements in air quality. Uh, based on this number, we calculated that replacing one truck older than eight years by a more recent truck brings more than $300,000 of social benefits. And so to conclude, I think it's important to reflect on how we can get more clean commercial vehicles on the roads. Uh, to get cleaner trucks on the road would require the implementation of scrappage programs to incentivize the removal of the oldest and most polluting vehicles. Implementing low emission zones that filter the vehicles that can enter could also be a solution to reduce air pollution in densely populated areas. And it's also essential to financially support the acquisition of cleaner trucks. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, in particular uh, to Faya Shodhuri and Matt Furda, who have done an amazing job developing uh, the truck traffic model for the GTHA, and which has inspired us for this study. Um, this concludes my presentation and be happy to take questions at the end. Very interesting results. Thank you very much, Laura. And everyone, if you have any questions for all of our speakers, please feel free to post them during the talks on the chat screen. With that, I would like to move to our third speaker, uh, namely Haydar al -Mashallah who's a research engineer at the Smart Price Center and currently a PhD candidate. His primary research focuses on supply chain, big data optimization, and e-commerce last mile delivery. With that, I would like to give the floor to uh, Haydar. Haydar, can you hear us? Hi, you are muted right now. Please unmute. Yeah, so, so for that, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm so thrilled today to present uh, in this March Free Center Symposium. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Hassini uh, won't be able to join us um, today given some time commitments. Um, uh, so let me just like um, uh, give uh, some um, update for uh, the research that are uh, currently ongoing in McMaster. Uh, let me go to the second slide here. So um, this is the e-commerce survey uh, 
I want to just like highlight two points um, here and I'll be having another uh, presentation next Friday talking about this survey uh, specifically as a separate presentation. Uh, but I want to hear to uh, show that we were working um, uh, through this uh, survey to assist the online uh, shopping behavior and preferences for the last mile delivery approach to prayer and post COVID-19. And one of the our plan is to uh, make use of the e-commerce, uh, of the e-commerce um, uh, results here to uh, plug them into our uh, next model or next uh, project, which is the e-commerce delivery traffic um, uh, volume. Um, so this model, which is the next project of us, is to estimate the traffic volume for e-commerce deliveries in low volume community and to developing an interpretable machine learning approach. Um, and the plan is to make the use of the e-commerce to provide some indicators for e-commerce delivery traffic volume. Um, and in this project, we are estimating uh, the traffic volume for e-commerce and developing um, this machine learning approach for that. In addition, we will be doing a follow-up project based on this um, model and then assess the impact of online deliveries on the environment in terms of CO2 uh, emissions. And I believe it is a hot topic and there's a lot of discussion going uh, on in this um, field. Uh, the next um, a project that we had actually is the last mile distribution solutions and we are working with an um, industrial partner uh, on designing uh, containers from distribution center to the customer through downtowns. Um, part of the problem that we uh, actually dealing with is we are investigating the use of double decker tracks. Um, and there is, um, we are looking at the distribution of problems with restrictions. Uh, the double decker uh, is in the say, at the same size of the double decker in London. And so if we want to use this type of double decker here in Ontario, I believe that some of the streets here um, are, um, have some bridges uh, and some roads where trucks won't go through. Um, so this would be an actually an obstacle and we are uh, taking this into our consideration uh, in uh, building our optimization uh, model. The fourth uh, project uh, here that um, the LTL network design, uh, less than a uh, track load, load uh, network design. And we are um, working with the same industrial partner to develop national LTL network for carrier and design big data based optimization algorithms in this project. Uh, the next project is the warehouse storage optimization. And in this, uh, in this project, actually, we are working with um, another industrial partner to optimal use of limited warehouse storage and design a revenue maximization rule. Um, and actually, when, for example, um, this, um, this time now, the warehouse would be very busy because they are doing the holiday type of um, things and seeing the Halloween and Christmas is, is coming. Uh, so all these occasions where they put a lot of stuff that warehouse storage is in need and um, uh, then probably uh, they will all packed all over. Uh, so now they look at how to design the layout of the warehouse. Um, later, uh, they would be just um, less busy and they would probably rent it out. So we are uh, focusing right now to um, use this storage space optimally and um, help them provide or um, develop um, a revenue maximization rule to, to, to decide on seasonal rental of extra warehouse space in this uh, project. The other project here, I'll be talking about it um, very uh, in details in the next uh, Friday. Um, actually, this type of review um, uh, paper, the goal is just to review what has been done so far in the literature uh, about the e-commerce logistics impacts on communities. Um, most, let's say, the takeaways of this project uh, were um, that the data sharing um, along the supply chain is kind of um, rare uh, given some some um, reasons like the competitions between the industry industry companies uh, so we are focusing on this and i'll be talking about it uh, in more details next uh, friday uh, during the smart first symposium next friday 
the last uh, project for today would be the um, e-commerce last mile delivery trends. Uh, my, my friend is working uh, on this to uh, um, he's reviewing the latest technologies used in this last mile uh, delivery and he's developing um, a framework for last mile logistics uh, analysis um, such as uh, using the drones uh, using and uh, other technologies in the last mile delivery. Um, in addition to all these projects, actually we have two projects that are under the de development right now, the supply chain and logistics data center. Um, and this aligns to the freight, um, freight data warehouse repository that Hassan uh, mentioned earlier uh, today. And the second, the, present, uh, the second project that I'm working on is the solutions for supply chain problems for uh, medical isotopes, which is kind of time sensitive of products and it needs kind of a specific optimization models and demand management uh, process for it. Uh, in addition, uh, next Friday, um, my colleagues will be presenting the mobile locker storage locations and location project and optimization of mobile robots warehouse fulfillment center. And at the end, I would like to uh, thank our partners and the research team team for this support. Uh, Region of Peel was the leader um, uh, that the leading development of the Smart Freight Center, uh, correlator with which we are working on uh, two research. And uh, with Nesta, we are which we are working with in uh, uh, one uh, project. Um, and our McMaster research team, and you can see that I, I there is kind of long uh, list. Thank you all to um, join um, me today and thank you. So that's it for today. Thank you very much, Adar. A lot of exciting projects ongoing, upcoming, and thanks for the updates from McMaster side. So next up, we have some updates from the York University side and our presenter will be Prof Assistant Professor Kevin Gingerich from uh, Department of Civil Engineering at York University. Uh, Kevin's research interests, especially the recent ones, include truck route choice, parking supply and demand, infrastructure supporting long combination vehicles. I believe it's a long list, but I will let him tell us a little bit about what he's been up to lately. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that everybody can see my screen at this point yes. now. Yes, it's great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, But um, uh, by the way, um, thank you for having me today. Um, I am uh, popping in uh, very briefly. I was unfortunately unable to see the other sessions um, because I am an organizer for another all day event happening uh, today. So uh, it's great to be able to pop in here though and give an update on some of our York University uh, research. So I'm gonna be focusing on uh, some of the work that's been conducted uh, recently uh, and is ongoing uh, within our Department of Civil Engineering, uh, particularly with emphasis on uh, the transportation faculty there, uh, including myself, uh, Peter Park, and Mehdi Nurinijad. Um, just a quick acknowledgement as well, before I forget, uh, thanks to, to Peter and uh, all those uh, others that have helped organize the symposium uh, today. So uh, if you were to come to Bergeron at York University, uh, even though you can't right now, um, what you would normally see is some space uh, that you can see here that's dedicated for our transportation uh, team, our graduate students, uh, to work on um, work on their research. Uh, in particular, this space is a designated um, space for SFC uh, as well. So a lot of the research that I'll talk about, um, especially the research that has been concluded at this point, uh, was done uh, in this space. Um, right now, I expect that that room is probably dark and full of cobwebs, um, but uh, we continue on with the research virtually anyways. So. When I think about the different types of projects that we've been uh, working on, I, uh, these four categories came to my mind. Um, so this includes truck mobility and routing, um, large and small vehicle research, uh, for example, looking at long combination vehicles, platoons, um, and on the small vehicle side, we're starting to look at uh, e-cargo uh, cycles. Um, truck and rail safety, which is a particular expertise of uh, Peter, uh, as well as optimizing goods movements, which uh, optimizations are an expertise uh, of Medi. Um, so these are four topics that we've um, done a lot of work on and are I'm expecting to us to see a lot more research on uh, in the near future. I'm gonna be focusing on the two left side topics uh, today. I will kind of go through some of the research to give a bit of a flavor of some of what we've done. 
Uh, hopefully it's not uh, too much coming at you. Um, but I will be focusing on the truck mobility and routing as well as truck and rail safety. Um, and so this is research again that's being conducted by the faculty within civil. Uh, and I'll try to point out the students um, that are really doing the legwork for this research as well. So uh, the first project shown here uh, is one that's looking at modeling long haul truck route choice in Ontario. So this is work that Ubaid uh, Ali uh, had uh, completed recently for his master's degree, uh, taking GPS data uh, and looking at trips between regions uh, in Ontario. Uh, really with the key goal of this type of model is to identify the different routes that are being used by trucks, as well as predict the probability uh, of uh, a truck using um, a specific route. Um, so this is uh, showing some model results in the bottom right corner. And the reason why I wanna mention that is if you take a look at some of the variables impacting route choice, uh, you'll see that cost, toll cost isn't included in here, which is an issue with a lot of revealed preference uh, data where uh, if we don't have a lot of sample data to work with, uh, it's not gonna work very well in our model. And because Ontario only has Highway 407, we don't have a lot of existing data on, on toll routes. So there's another project that's currently ongoing right now um, that Yashar Zaranzada is working on uh, to do a stated preference uh, study of truck road choice behavior. So this is a survey uh, for truck, uh, truck carriers um, and in particular drivers and decision makers uh, to help us really um, flesh out the importance of tolls and value of time on, on route choice. For those of you that are familiar with stated preference surveys, this is a efficient design using engine software. Uh, you can see an example uh, question that would be asked in the stated preference um, that's being um, put into Qualtrics software as the survey interface. Uh, and this is a survey that we're gonna be um, putting out as a pilot um, really soon uh, in the next, uh, the next little while. Um, so those were a little bit more macroscopic, but um, we're also looking more microscopic. Uh, so this is one example, and I believe there's a presentation of that next week, as well as a few of these other research projects I'm talking about, um, where Ravi Rampur was looking at a, um, a corridor in the region of Peel, looking at Dixie Road, uh, and taking a look at the impact of truck single priority along that corridor, which has um, a heavy prominence of, of trucks along there. One of the important things that I point out here is towards the bottom, you'll see I put in the, uh, the reduction in travel time for uh, all vehicles, cars and trucks, about five to 6% uh, reduction in the travel time. Um, and it's something I like to emphasize when I talk about this project is that uh, even though we're focusing on prioritizing trucks, the nice thing about it is cars are impacted by the trucks quite a bit as well. So by helping uh, make the movement of trucks more efficient, we're also improving the travel time of, of the cars. Uh, another microscopic type of project um, that's currently ongoing is research by uh, Soha uh, Syed, who's looking at intelligent lane utilization. So evaluating truck restriction lanes and truck only lanes uh, in, in the region of Peel, as well as um, there's a micro simulation modeling work going on for a few corridors. Um, so there's a few safety projects that I wanted to highlight as well here. Uh, the, uh, so there's a, 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 you, some of you may be familiar with Eric Nevland, who's currently working for the region of Peel. Uh, this was research that he worked on uh, where he was looking at the supply of truck rest stops, uh, which is particularly important we found because oftentimes the notable or the known locations are the common areas like Flying J on routes. There's a lot of other uh, locations that are used uh, by trucks for rest stops. So his work was looking at identifying those rest stops using uh, GPS data, classifying them by type, as well as estimate the amount of parking available in different zones, in this case, in the region of Peel. Um, there's another project here related to safety, which is looking at the impact of speed characteristics uh, on trucks for high-speed highways. So this was work completed by, um, by Crystal Wang. Um, and this was a data fusion with GPS, which we use a lot of um, in the research projects you guys are seeing here, and, and weigh in motion data that was available for a corridor in uh, BC. So this was looking at, for example, 
um, strategies where you could look at uniform speed limits or differential speed limits, as well as spot speed enforcement and average speed enforcement uh, to take a look at how we can improve uh, the speed profile to improve the safety between cars and trucks on a road. Uh, another project here, uh, which I'll very quickly go through is uh, the derailment uh, prediction model of uh, Canada's rail network, which is uh, work um, worked on by Tavia Chow uh, for her master's degree, which she completed. Uh, so she was creating a segment level model that can predict um, the, the most likely segments for derailments that are of concern. Um, so this was using a couple of different model types, um, but was, uh, was a really interesting um, model. So just very quickly, because uh, I don't want to take up too much more time, I wanted to show very briefly here a couple of the other projects that are mostly ongoing right now. Um, there's an, a lot of work going on in terms of truck platooning uh, that Tandir uh, Chowdhury is focusing on, as well as some work on long combination vehicles. Um, we have some pilot studies that are planned using e-cargo cycles uh, in the GTA. Uh, we're also looking at an inter interesting project that's um, looking at the optimization of cargo delivery and passenger uh, ride uh, sharing. And uh, the last project here, there's another one that we're working on right now. Uh, that's a project with Transport Canada to look at mobility interventions to protect supply chain workers during pandemics in the region of uh, Peel. So this is looking at um, the rest stops that we've been doing some other research on and the distribution centers in the area and try to uh, look at the prioritization of those rest stops uh, as they pertain to the linkage between uh, the stopping at the truck rest stop first and then going to the distribution uh, center afterwards uh, in order to make sure that we have available parking um, that's um, there to supply that activity and to make sure that there's proper amenities and support to uh, reduce uh, COVID transmission. So I think that's probably getting to the end of my time today. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for, for having me today. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you all, all of our presenters. So please feel free to again post your questions on the chat screen, but I would like to kick it off with some questions we already received during the talks. So maybe let me go back to the beginning of the order. So the first question is for Hassan. Uh, what are the criteria that make the public a data pub public or restricted? So what makes a data that you have public or restricted? Um, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, actually, what is will make the data actually public or restricted or internal data? It is mainly we are following the data provider uh, policy and procedure. If this data, we can publish it uh, to the public users or it should be restricted for specific user group or for specific research and what is uh, allowing what what we can allow in terms of analysis on top of this data but mainly it will be the data provider or the data contributor who, who can give this rules and policy or procedure i see thank you and i also have a quick question uh, for the data sharing policies you mentioned so will there be a data sharing policy or plan for people outside of Smart Freight Center, none of SFC members? Uh, data sharing policy, actually it's so far, it is for the Smart Freight Center users. Uh, and uh, we, we already addressed uh, in, in the data sharing policy, if it is allowed for uh, private sector, which is so far, it is not there. Uh, as, as we are following the data sharing uh, agreement with the, service pro with the data provider actually. But so far, just to answer the question in, in a specific manner, it is so far for, for the, uh, the the Smart Freight Center uh, uh, researchers and users. Okay, good to know, hopefully more to come. Uh, one last question that I received for you, Hassan, at this moment is, could you please like clarify the meaning of data aggregation? Maybe it, may, it wasn't so clear. So maybe could you give us an example of data aggregation? Um, okay, regarding data aggregation, actually we are receiving the, the raw data from the data providers. Uh, we, we are not sharing the data as is. We are doing a processing on this data. We are doing uh, anonymization for this data. Uh, we, for example, um, um, each 10 links, for example, we aggregated uh, as a one big link where they cannot uh, 
have the accurate value or we can add plus minus 20% of error to that data. Where actually the main objective of uh, data aggregation uh, to give the end user not the actual uh, values of the data, to give them the accurate value, the, the accurate data structure where they can build their queries and later on they can submit the queries for the data center, the smart fair data center team where they can process their queries on the actual data. Um, we are helping the end user just to, to, or the researchers to understand the data structure rather than to have the right value of the data. I see. So when I, I was thinking of something like you aggregate different groups into a single group type of an aggregation, but I guess you were meaning something else. Thanks for yeah. clarifying. All right. So the next question is actually for Laura. Uh, the question is as follows, Laura. Has there been a decrease increase in emissions from trucks or commercial vehicles in 2020, where everything was going down during the pandemic compared to previous years? Do you have any information about the impact of 2020? I don't have specific information, but I think it's clear that there's been an increase in uh, deliveries uh, during the pandemic. And so uh, there's obviously the uh, emissions associated with this increase in traffic from uh, commercial vehicles. Um, but it's difficult to just isolate the impact of uh, tra traffic on uh, ambient air quality. I see. And I'm sure you will have many more projects coming up about after 2020 related yes. analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll hear more from in the upcoming years. Uh, one more question, Laura, I have received. Uh, would the use of autonomous vehicles and any efficiencies from there you think will improve the emissions or air quality? We'll see an improvement in the emissions, probably because uh, with technologies such as truck platooning, we'll uh, have uh, more um, yeah, smoother uh, traffic patterns and so uh, lower emission in that sense, but um, autonomous vehicles also mean that there will be more space on the roads. And so uh, anytime there's more uh, space on the roads, there's more traffic coming in. And so uh, increased emissions associated with this. Uh, maybe I have a personal question, but maybe I will come back after I go through our audience's questions. Thank you, Laura. And for Haidar, I have the first question as follows. How does supply chain and logistics data center that you mentioned actually connects to the initiatives such as Transport Canada's regional supply chain visibility projects? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Um, actually, that, that, question, uh, that, that um, initiative that uh, I was talking about, the supply chain um, repository, um, is still under um, development. Um, we are trying to find, um, uh, say, links with those uh, bigger uh, initiatives. Uh, so, for example, right now we, uh, um, within that initiative, within that supply chain uh, data center that we are uh, proposing, um, we have some uh, sub initiatives inside. Uh, let's say one of them is to um, adding some values for the data uh, in terms of let's say visibility. So um, we are we are planning to uh, get some let's say uh, public data from um, uh, transport Transport Canada or from Stats Canada and put them into uh, maps in order to give some better, uh, let's say, insights, and then link them to um, different, uh, different, let's say, related, uh, related data or related um, subjects. So I think that's, um, that's one of the ideas that we have so far uh, for um, linking the data and get it, get it some, some visibility. For that specific project uh, for the transport, uh, for the transport kind of visibility, and I believe, uh, or just like if I recall correctly, they were working with um, uh, Hamilton Port. Um, so I think at some uh, point or some at some point in the future, they would be kind of, um, I hope that we can do a collaboration with them, but so far um, our plan or our initial plan to get some uh, public data in addition to other uh, data from um, other, let's say, um, uh, sources and put them in, um, let's say better uh, visibility um, or using our tools, uh, for example, uh, the Tableau uh, website and then uh, share the data. Um, yeah, so that's it, I guess so. Thank you. 
Thank you. One quick question, Haydar, just yeah. for clarification. In the first project that you talked about, who was the e-commerce e-commerce survey targeting? Yeah, the e-commerce uh, the e-commerce survey uh, is totally addressed for um, uh, residents uh, in Peel region, to be specific. Um, we are studying, or we. We are studying, let's say, the shopping behavior. We have like six sections in that survey, and I believe it's totally um, a rich survey, and it can be, um, um, let's say, implemented in, um, in other um, uh, projects or research. Uh, yeah, so the people are the residents of, yeah, period. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much for clarification. Yeah. And Kevin, we have a question or two for you. So. Can you please expand a bit on the LCV analysis underway by York University and any outcomes obtained so far? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can see that was a question by uh, by Parshan there. Um, yeah, the the plans have actually changed relatively recently, but uh, our plan right now is to specifically look at um, interchanges and intersections, um, different types that are used uh, throughout Ontario. Um, and basically look at the geometric uh, factors uh, for those um, intersections and interchanges and basically start to do sweat path analysis uh, for long combination vehicles of different types uh, in order to look at the types of variables that are impeding, uh, impeding them and causing the conflict. Uh, essentially with the end goal really in that case being to uh, model, um, uh, create a, a model uh, of those factors to see which tend to be the most uh, important factors, um, probably besides, for example, like curb, curb radii, which would be a very common one. I see. Thank you. And still in 30 more seconds from Matt's time, I would like to ask you, Kevin, one more question uh, about the long haul truck network. So the question was about like, does it include only part of America or whole America? The map wasn't, I guess, very clear in the slide. If it doesn't include the whole America, why? So can we clarify that, please? Yeah, so that specific study only includes, um, the focus was Ontario. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. including trips that um, either start or end within regions in Ontario. Um, and then we did allow for those trips that are going outside um, of Ontario, but they're always either starting or ending. Um, that was just a, a decision to focus on for the scope of the project focus on Ontario. Um, the data itself, uh, the data that I was using, we did have it for all of Canada and the US. So it could easily be expanded in the future. But yeah, that was the, the scope of the project. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. And I would like to thank all of our speakers again. And next up for the last presentation of today, I would like to give the floor to Matt Roda, who is a professor at civil engineering at the University of Toronto. And in fact, he's the chair of our Smart Freight Center, as well as the Canada Research Chair in Freight Transportation and Logistics. And Matt, please take it away to close the day for this great symposium. Wonderful, thank you very much, Marve. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I guess we've come to the end of our first round of the Smart Freight Symposium. I'm really thrilled with the way it's going so far. Really happy to see so many participants. I think I counted, uh, you know, approximately 110 people online at one point in time. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. This is really great to see so much interest in uh, in freight and goods movement. Uh, I would say that these conversations, these kinds of symposia, are really vital to um, uh, making progress on goods movement and all of our efforts to uh, uh, improve the sustainability, the efficiency and quality of life issues surrounding freight transportation. I think we're, we're making strides now. I think there's a lot more to do in the future. And the presentations I think we've seen today are really um, a testament to the quality and the extent of work that's being done now. I, I think that has ramped up quite a bit over the past several years. And it's really good to see that. And, and that goes for organizations of all types. We've seen today presentations from uh, the private sector, from the public sector, uh, from non-governmental organizations, industry associations, and of course, the, uh, my colleagues at the academic uh, institutions. I think it's with partnerships like these that we're able to uh, you know, pull together and actually make things happen in real life. Uh, I, there was uh, uh, some questions about getting access to these presentations. 
I know that we've been recording the sessions. Uh, we're in the process of getting permissions from all of our speakers to uh, post the presentations on the Smart Freight Center website and subject to those permissions, we're gonna uh, make those available for you to come back to. We'll try to get those up as soon as possible on the Smart Freight Center website. Uh, I'd like to wrap up with some thank yous. This kind of, um, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes for an event like this and a lot of people that you don't see on the screen but are actually working uh, very hard behind the scenes. First of all, Peter Park, thank you very much for organizing uh, this session and also to the team of people that are working with you at York University, including Ariel and Sandy and Willem. I know that uh, behind the scenes there's a lot of legwork that's, that's been going on to pull together such an interesting program but also to make sure that the technology is working smoothly. Also, thank you to uh, Judy Farvolden and, and Pat Doherty at University of Toronto. They have played a big role in, uh, in organizing the event as well. And uh, I know that Pat has been in communication with all of you uh, in getting you uh, registered and so on. All of our speakers. I, you know, I think it goes without saying we are expecting great presentations and you have not disappointed us. But I wanted also to point out your leadership in uh, that each one of you is, um, is you know, playing a big leadership role in, in moving goods movement forward in the region and addressing some of those challenges around freight transportation. It's great to see that you're, uh, that you're taking on this topic area. Moderators uh, to Judy and to Todd and to Merve, thank you for your time today. Uh, I, amazing that we could keep our presentations down to 10 minutes and uh, have lots of time for questions. Uh, that, that, that was great. Really went smoothly today. Thank you for that. And then finally, to all the rest of you who have joined us today. And I want to point out, especially uh, to the organizations that are sponsoring our research or are partnering with uh, the uh, work of the Smart Freight Center actually in active ways, also helping with the, with the analysis in some cases, providing data, providing funding. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are uh, playing a big role now in the Smart Freight Center uh, in a variety of projects and a variety of funding initiatives. Some of you are just starting up your relationship with the Smart Freight Center, and we're really looking forward to ramping up quickly with some, a whole bunch of new projects that we're starting up. Uh, others have been with us from the very beginning, especially the region of Peel, who provided seed funding for the Smart Freight Center. Uh, it's, you know, that, that leadership role that, uh, this, that the region of Peel has been playing uh, in getting this whole initiative off the ground has been really, really wonderful. <clears throat> uh, next week, Friday, November 27th, York University is again going to be hosting the second round of the Smart Freight Symposium. Uh, and so I'm going to invite you all to join us again next week, Friday. The, the um, flavor of the next week's uh, round of the symposium is going to be really focusing on the student-led research projects at uh, the universities, including York University, McMaster University, and University of Toronto, but also our newest uh, partner in waiting, uh, Ryerson University. So we'll be hearing from them as well. And I can never go far without uh, acknowledging all of the students and postdocs who really provide the energy and the talent and really the brains to a large extent behind the work that uh, we do at the Smart Freight Center, especially at the uh, university institutions. These are the, these are the students that are going to be the next generation of the workforce and uh, going to be the leaders of tomorrow. So really I uh, encourage you all to join us again next Friday and see the, so the fruits of their labors. So uh, that concludes the uh, Smart Freight Symposium round one. And I'm going to now wish you all a wonderful weekend and a safe weekend. And I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great, great weekend and see you next week. Bye.